Hey everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point. And we are here today back with this response from the Eastern District of New York versus uh, Robert Sylvester Kelly. So in the last video, I did their stories, like their summation of each one of the well, not all of the people that testified, but I guess the main people uh, that testified or that were either alleged victims or bad acts testimony. And I forgot to go in and break those up. It is a long video. It's like three hours long, but I can go in and put in the description where I'm talking about each person and the time frame, and then you can just click on that and it will take you straight to that portion of the video. I forgot to do that, but I'll go ahead and do that today as I'm waiting on this video to load. So we're gonna pick up here under discussion. And so after they went through that long speech, breaking down their assertion of everything that happened, and keep in mind, they spent the testimony to their benefit, but even in spending, Spinning the testimony, it still doesn't show us a racketeering act. And I don't know why it is so hard for people to fathom that they can go in and bring these charges against somebody and say that everyday behavior, normal behavior that people engage in every day is a racketeering thing. And I tried to break it down to you all, showing you just how simple this would be for them to go and attack other people, like regular people, not just, you know, a celebrity or superstar, but they can do this to everyday people if they wanted to and just come up with these bogus charges. And these are serious charges. Like these aren't just, you know, basic, oh, you're going to get two or three years for doing this. These charges could land this man in prison for the rest of his life. And that's the part that really be killing me. Okay, so if you haven't had a chance, go back, um, watch that video. I will have the break, you know, the timestamps, um, you know, after I finish doing this. And you can easily find, like, the different people that you're interested in and what they had to say about them. So let's go ahead and jump into the portion that they refer to as the discussion. So it says, Kelly challenges the sufficiency of the evidence as to each of the counts of conviction. As set forth in detail below, there was more than sufficient evidence adduced at trial supporting each count of conviction. And as the racketeering conviction, count one, each racketeering act found proven by the jury. One, legal standard. In analyzing a defendant's Rule 29 motion, the court must view the evidence in the light most favorable to the government. <laughs> so they letting Ann Donnelly know that it doesn't matter what the defense is, you got to take our side, you know, like you're on our side, so you got to see it our way when you're making your decision. So I am going to um, repeat that. View the evidence in the light most favorable to the government drawing all inferences in the government's favor and deferring to the jury's assessment of the witness credibility. And then remember they had pages and pages and pages of case law that they were going to cite in their um, documents. So that quote comes from United States versus Sabanini, which was a case heard in the Second Circuit in 2010 and United States versus Payne, which was also heard in the second district of 2010. 
And then they quote, assessments of witness credibility and choices between competing inferences lie solely within the province of the jury. In undertaking this review, this court considers the government's case in its totality rather than in its parts, mindful that the sufficiency test may be satisfied by circumstantial evidence alone. United States v. Hawkins, Second Circuit, 2008. Following this review, the court must affirm the conviction if any rational, tr they have trier, but I think it's tier, a fact could have found the essential elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. United States versus Cosney, Second Circuit, 2011. Internal quotation marks omitted. Two, the racketeering conviction was sound. Kelly raises several challenges to the propriety of his RICO conviction. He argues that the government did not prove, one, that an enterprise existed, and two, that the enterprise affected interstate or foreign commerce, or three, a pattern of racketeering activity. He is wrong in all aspects. A, the government adduced sufficient evidence of an enterprise. Kelly argues that the government failed to prove an enterprise because one, the enterprise proved by the government lacked a common purpose. Um, you didn't prove an enterprise. Two, the enterprise was not distinct from its racketeering activities. And three, the enterprise was not distinct from Kelly alone. Each of those arguments is without merit. Mm. One, applicable law. The RICO statute provides that its terms are to be liberally construed to effectuate its remedial purpose. So they're basically saying that uh, they have leeway to say and do whatever they want to to prove a RICO and we just have to deal with it. Boyle versus United States. Um, that was a case from 2009. It says under the RICO statute, an enterprise is defined to include any dot, dot, dot. So they don't cut out a bunch of what was said there union or group of individuals associated in fact although not a legal entity in boyle a 2009 case rejecting a challenge to a substantive rico conviction in the district the U the supreme court held that to sustain a rico conviction an association in fact enterprise must have at least three structural features a purpose relationships among those associated with the enterprise and longevity sufficient to permit these associates to pursue the enterprise's purpose. So now what Von Jean pointed out, you know, in terms of this nonsense that they just put there, is that they're claiming that this enterprise lasted 30 years, but over the course of those 30 years, you didn't have the same people so there were people that worked for him, you know, for a year or two that testified about stuff that happened, you know, back in the 90s or early 2000s. And then you had people that were more recent. And so it didn't appear that this whole enterprise that they're creating lasted the entire 30 years that they are trying to cover. And let's see, and then it goes on and quotes um, another section that says, observing that the statutory definition of enterprise in United States Code 18, section 1961 is, does not specifically define the outer boundaries of the enterprise concept, and that the definition is obviously broad and has a wide reach. An enterprise does not require a hierarchy, or regular meetings regarding enterprise affairs, or a set membership, or established rules. An association, in fact, enterprise, is simply a continuing unit that functions with a common purpose. Okay, so y'all... <laughs> so basically, if you've had some friends for a certain amount of times, and one of your friends goes out and commit a crime... They can come back and say that all of y'all were a part of that because y'all were association. Like they're basically saying that the definition of an enterprise is so, the bar, the standard is so low 
to establishing an enterprise that it could simply be a group of friends, best friends who've been friends since high school, and then one of them, you know, commits a crime when they're in their 40s or 50s, and then suddenly they can pull all y'all in and say, oh, but they were the enterprise, so let's charge them with a RICO instead of whatever it is that the person actually did. So the enterprise may exist even if its membership changes over time. States versus Morrow. Existence of enterprise not defeated by changes in membership. Ruling that an internal dispute over control of the enterprise did not signal the end of the enterprise. I'll hear this right. United States versus Coonan. An association, in fact, enterprise continues to exist even though it undergoes change in leadership. Upholding, oh, and that was a case from the Second Circuit, 1980, upholding instruction that membership in an enterprise may change over time. Two, members of the enterprise shared a common purpose to engage in a course of conduct. Kelly argues that the government's proof at trial liked a showing that members of the alleged enterprise shared a common purpose. He is wrong. As described above, the government elicited hours of testimony by members of Kelly's inner circle who told the jury how they worked tirelessly to promote Kelly's music and to meet his personal needs. Tom Arnold and Diana Copeland each testified about the expansive duties Kelly expected each to perform. They variously testified that they set up business meetings for Kelly arranged tour dates, shuttled Kelly's female guests, made travel reservations for Kelly's female guests, and performed miscellaneous errands for Kelly. Anthony Navarro and Nicholas Williams testified about their roles as runners for Kelly in the mid to late 2000s, which included basic tasks around the studio and assisting the engineers who assisted in Kelly's music, as well as answering phone calls from Kelly's female guests bringing food to his female guests, and even picking up herpes medication for Kelly. They're going to make sure they throw their herpes in there, okay? Cheryl Mike, Elizette Mayweather, and Suzette Mayweather testified about their roles as personal assistants for Kelly in the 2010s, which variously included arranging travel for Kelly's female guests, ordering food for Kelly and his guests, and accompanying Kelly's female guests to malls, salons, and Kelly's concerts. Many testified how Kelly fined them if they failed in Kelly's eyes. Okay, so you know I'm going to put this in context to show how stupid it is. So, I used to work for this benefits company, and it was a salaried position, which meant that I had to be there when I had to be there, and it didn't matter how many hours a week that I worked, I was going to get paid that same amount of money. So, I had to do whatever the company told me to do within my 40-hour week. I had to travel to meet with clients within my 40 hour week. I had to talk to clients on the phone. I had to investigate things that the client's employees were telling them. I worked on the diversity team. I worked on the employee of the month team. I, you know, I did all these different things that were outside the scope of what I was actually hired to do. But as a salaried employee, if it was connected to my job, I had to do it. I also worked at a church. I was part-time at that church, but I put in more than part-time hours. And it was often considered anything that I did outside of my scheduled hours was considered volunteer work, okay? And I probably could take them to court and sue them, right? You know, to get my money. But anyway, I did a whole bunch of stuff that was outside of being the membership analyst. Okay, that was my official title, but I did all kinds of stuff, planning events. I created a magazine for the church. 
I made sure we had people doing interviews, were selling ads for the magazine to pay for the magazine. I helped the pastor with whatever he needed outside of what he wanted his secretary to do. So all kinds of things that I was doing outside the scope of my work. So basically what they're saying there is because I did those things, if they wanted to charge the pastor with a crime, they could then bring in all the employees of the church and say that because we were performing the duties that he assigned to us to do, that we are part of the enterprise. They could go back to the company that I work for as the client relationship manager and say, and then if they want to bring that company into a RICO, they could say that the employees were the enterprise because we were doing the things that the company told us to do to get our paycheck. So that's how basic and simplified they are trying to make this RICO. And I hope people are paying attention because any of us could get caught up in some nonsense like that. And then they say, oh, well, we helped form the enterprise when we were just doing our jobs or we were just in a group of friends, but suddenly we're the, the RICO enterprise. So then it goes on to say, to the extent that Kelly argues that proof of an enterprise requires that members of the enterprise shared a common purpose of criminality rather than a common purpose of engaging in a particular course of conduct, he is wrong. In support of the, his argument, Kelly cites to language in First Capital Asset Management versus Satinwood Incorporated, which was heard by the Second Circuit in 2004, that the individuals comprising an enterprise must share a common purpose to engage in a particular fraudulent course of conduct and work together to achieve such purposes, emphasis added. Kelly uses the language out of context, just like y'all using the language out of context, but we're going to carry on. The language in Satinwood was adopted from an opinion by a district court, Mole versus U.S. Life Title Insurance Company of New York, Southern District of New York, 1987. A closer look at Mall and the cases cited by the district court in Mall shows that there the defendants argue that the alleged enterprise essentially overlapped with the pattern of racketeering. In Mall, the defendant argued that the plaintiff had not sufficiently proved that an amorphous group of real estate attorneys and other individuals engaged in the real estate settlement industry in New York constituted an enterprise or otherwise engaged in a common purpose beyond the alleged pattern of racketeering activity. United States versus Turkey in 1981, the Mall Court explained that to be an enterprise, the group must have a common purpose of engaging in a course of conduct. That, of course, is the standard for an enterprise, and it does not require that the enterprise be grounded in criminality. But in Mall and the cases cited in Mall, the common purpose was the alleged course of fraud, leading the Mall Court to use the language cited by Kelly. Notwithstanding the language used in Mall and cited by Kelly, it is well established that an enterprise may have a common purpose of engaging in a wholly legitimate course of conduct, and there is no requirement whatsoever that the enterprise members have a common purpose of fraud or any other criminality. Indeed, although RICO does not specifically define the outer boundaries of the enterprise concept, it is clear that any legal entity may qualify as a RICO enterprise. <laughs> Moss versus BMO Harris Bank, Eastern District of New York, 2017, cited an internal quotation marks omitted. Okay, are y'all following this? Um, basically, you could be called up in a RICO case just by knowing somebody and doing what you are supposed to be doing on any job that you have, okay? So the enterprise alleged by the government and found proven by the jury was one comprised of an inner circle who shared a common purpose of engaging in a course of conduct. That common purpose was largely not criminal. 
the inner circle worked together to promote Kelly's music and his brand and to meet his personal needs, which included recruiting women and girls. Viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the government, as the court must in, in evaluating a Rule 29 motion, the evidence of an enterprise as required for the RICO violation was more than sufficient. Three, the enterprise was distinct from its racketeering activities. Kelly contends that the government failed to introduce evidence showing that the enterprise was distinct from the racketeering activities. In so arguing, Kelly again misconstrues that the, misconstrues that the government is required to prove what the government is required to prove. It is true that the government must prove both the enterprise and the pattern of racketeering activity and that proof of one does not necessarily establish the other. Turkey, for example, if several individuals independently and without coordination engaged in a pattern of RICO predicate offenses, Proof of these patterns must not be enough to show that the individuals were members of the enterprise. Boyle, however, that they are separate elements does not mean that the existence of an enterprise may never be inferred from the evidence showing that the persons associated with the enterprise engaged in a pattern of racketeering activity. On this point, the court reiterated its conclusion that it made in Turkey that proof of a pattern of racketeering activity may be sufficient in a particular case to permit a jury to infer the existence of an association in fact enterprise. Now they just talk it all round and round about in circles now. In any event, as set forth above the government adduced sufficient evidence of an enterprise and as set forth in great detail below, the government adduced sufficient evidence of the pattern of racketeering. Therefore, Kelly's argument fails. So then they got a note. It says, in support of his argument, Kelly cites without discussion two cases, United States versus Smith, which was heard in the 10th Circuit in 2005, a United States versus Keltner, which was heard in the Eighth Circuit in 1998. In Smith, the Tenth Circuit wrote, it is not necessary to show that the enterprise has some function wholly unrelated to the racketeering activity, but rather that it has an existence beyond that which is necessary merely to commit each of the acts charged as predicate racketeering offenses. In Keltner, the Eighth Circuit stated, our focus is to ensure that RICO's severe penalties are limited to enterprises consisting of more than simple conspiracies to perpetuate the predicate acts of racketeering. But that's exactly what y'all are doing. And then Keltner, citation and quotation marks admitted, both of these cases were decided before the Supreme Court's decision in Boyle and to the extent that they are in conflict with Boyle, they are no longer good law. <laughs> okay. All right. So they're saying that um, the case that um, Jennifer Bonjean cited isn't good law because it was um, decided before the Supreme Court made its decision. Anyway, child number four, the enterprise was distinct from Kelly. Kelly also asserts that the government's proof of an enterprise failed because it did not demonstrate that Kelly was distinct from the enterprise. Again, he is wrong. At trial, the government offered evidence that Kelly surrounded himself with his inner circle and Kelly and his inner circle together worked to promote his brand and to meet his personal needs. Because the enterprise comprised of Kelly and his inner circle consisted of more than just Kelly and even more than just Kelly's employees, it is sufficiently distinct. Talking in circles. Kelly's reliance on a series of cases where the defendant was a, was a corporation is in a, pro in a posit. Okay, for example, in Riverwoods, Chappaqua Corp versus Marine Midland Bank, 30, I'm sorry, 2nd District of 1994, the defendant was a corporation. Mar Marine Midland Bank, N.A., 
and the enterprise was the restructuring group, which consisted of bank employees acting in the course of their employment and on behalf of the corporation. The circuit court explained that where employees of a corporation associate together to commit a pattern of predicate acts in the course of their employment and on behalf of the corporation, the employees in association with the corporation do not form an enterprise distinct from the corporation. The Second Circuit reasoned because a corporation can only function through its employees and agents, any act of the corporation can be viewed as such an enterprise and the enterprise in reality no more than the defendant itself. So every day you guys are going to work and performing your assigned duties. You are part of an enterprise, okay? And if your company goes down, you could be going down with your company also, okay? Because you are a willing participant of that enterprise. And what's funny about what they just, that case that they just cited, because I write um, blogs for websites as my primary source of income. And I wrote a blog, um, by God, by, probably about a month ago, if it was that long, about the biggest settlements, the biggest, um, oh my God, it had to do with the, with the financial industry, and it was the biggest fines that were imposed for money, money laundering was what it was about. So the biggest fines in money laundering amongst financial institutions in 2021 across the country. And one of the, um, one of the cases that I cited was this Marine Midland Bank. So that's um, quite interesting. And just to let you guys know that the government, governments across the country receive billions of dollars in fines against corporations every day for breaking laws, you know, that um, have to do with money laundering. Like there were companies that were fined like $250 million. It was just like astronomical numbers in money that they were finding like Capital One and companies that we are very familiar with uh, because their employees didn't follow proper procedures and people were allowed, you know, to do stuff that they shouldn't have been able to do. Like things should have been caught that um, customers were doing, but because the employees weren't paying attention or because they were receiving bribes from these countries that they were, or these companies that they would just let this stuff go through. And then the government comes back and investigate the people. And then they just make billions of dollars off of these people. And some of the stuff was egregious. It was like, they knew they were break, breaking the law, but some of it was just real petty stuff. And these people were still fined millions of dollars that they didn't have to pay um, this organization that's over money laundering. So let's move on. Um, in the, in any event, the mere fact, wait, hold on guys. Oh, sorry about that. I'm losing my voice. So it says in any event, the mere fact that Kelly engages employees is not a shield against a RICO conviction notwithstanding the fact that Kelly may use his employees to carry out some of the alleged conduct. At trial, the government adduced ample evidence that Kelly can and did, in fact, function separate and apparent, separate and apart from his employees and agents. B, the enterprise affected interstate and foreign commerce. Kelly claims the government did not adduce sufficient evidence of the interstate commerce. Sorry guys, lost, lost my space here. Of the interstate commerce. Furthermore, although only a de minimis effect is required, the effect was much more here. For a period of years, members of the enterprise regularly arranged travel throughout the country and internationally for Kelly other members of the enterprise and Kelly's alleged victims and other female guests. 
Between 2003 and 2011, Kelly's employee Tom Arnold arranged travel for Kelly's female guests using a travel company, Preferred Travel, and by booking flights on orbits. Arnold traveled internationally with Kelly. Kelly's employee Diana Copeland arranged travel for Kelly's female guests. That alone is more than sufficient to prove this element. United States versus Robertson from 1995 states a corporation is generally engaged in, in commerce when it itself directly engaged in the production, distribution, or acquisition of goods or services in interstate commerce. United States versus AM Building Maintenance, American Building Maintenance Industry, and that was from 1975. There was also evidence that Kelly used telephones to communicate with his victims who were located in different states, including Sonia, Alexis, Azriel, Faith, and Anna. Similarly, members of Kelly's inner circle, including Diana Copeland, Alizette Mayweather, Suzette Mayweather, and Cheryl Mack, communicated by telephone with Kelly's female guests. Copeland received text messages from Kelly's guests. Use of an instrumentality of commerce such as a telephone line is also generally viewed as an activity that affects interstate commerce. <laughs> Finding defendants placement of out-of-state phone calls to be a connection with interstate commerce under Hobbs Act, United States versus Muskovsky, 7th Circuit, 1988, finding effect on interstate commerce based on the use of interstate telephone calls to verify credit card transactions. Similarly, in Illinois and around the country, Kelly regularly used iPads, Canon cameras, and VHS tapes, all of which were manufactured outside of Illinois. <laughs> So y'all, all of us are guilty of interstate commerce, I guess, because we using these phones that were made in other countries that weren't even made in the United States. I guess when we call customer service at different places, that's interstate commerce. When you go online and order from Amazon and have packages sent to people, instead of receiving the package, you send the gift to the recipient, that's interstate commerce. Like all of that could be construed as interstate commerce, according to, you know, the RICO laws. So to the extent that Kelly intended to assert a constitutional challenge to RICO, one has not properly been presented. Kelly summarily writes, without citation to any case, the de minimis effect approach here amounts to an unconstitutional extension of Congress's commerce power and is contrary to RICO's distinctly economic legislative history. That alone is not sufficient to raise a constitutional challenge. United States versus body. Now, wait a minute. So they're going to say because Bonjean uh, put her opinion in the motion that that doesn't raise a valid point constitutional challenge but they've been inserting their opinion throughout this entire document but then i guess their opinion shouldn't be considered as well because they're basically doing the same thing so it says that alone is not sufficient to raise a constitutional challenge see united states versus body second circuit 2013 issues averted to in a perfunctionary manner unaccompanied by some effort at developed argumentation are deemed waived. Internal quotation marks omitted. In any event, such a challenge would fail. RICO constitutes a valid exercise of Congress Commerce Clause powers on its face and as applied here. United States versus Miller, Second Circuit 1997, that Supreme Court's decisions in United States versus Lopez from 1995 did not alter the principle that where the type of activity at issue has been found by Congress to have a substantial connection with interstate commerce, the government need only prove that the individual subject transaction has a de minimis effect on interstate commerce. United States versus Torres, upholding um, Section 1959, 
The statute criminalizing violent crimes in aid of racketeering as a valid exercise of Congress's power under the Commerce Call. But we're not even talking about no alleged crime um, of violence here. Oh, child, they get on my nerves. So, see, there was sufficient evidence of a pattern of racketeering activity. Kelly challenges the sufficiency of the racketeering conviction by arguing that there was insufficient evidence of each of the predicate racketeering acts that the jury found proven. As described below, there was sufficient evidence of each predicate racketeering act. However, even assuming arguendo that there was not sufficient evidence of a particular racketeering act, the conviction would stand so long as there remains sufficient evidence of two predicate racketeering acts, including one within five years of the indictment, racketeering acts 8 and 14, or 8 to 14, and one within 10 years of the most racketeering act, racketeering acts 5 to 13. Child, okay, and then C, United States Code 18, section 1961 at 0.5, defining pattern of racketeering activity as requiring at least two acts of racketeering activity, one of which occurred after the effective date of this chapter and the last of which occurred within 10 years, excluding any period of imprisonment after the commission of a prior act of racketeering. One, bribery. Kelly asserts that the government failed to prove that he committed the crime of bribery as alleged in Racketeering Act 1. Specifically, Kelly claims that the record label, ev the record liked evidence of Kelly's knowledge of how Smith obtained the fraudulent identification Kelly and Aaliyah used to obtain a marriage license, i.e. by bribing an employee at a public aid office. Kelly further contends that the government failed to meet the relatedness and statute of limitations standard under RICO. Kelly is wrong on each of these fronts. The government presented ample direct and circumstantial evidence to prove racketeering Act 1. As a preliminary matter, there can be no dispute and Kelly appears to concede that the government presented evidence beyond a reasonable doubt the charged barbary occurred, namely that Smith, Kelly's then tour manor, manager, tendered approximately $500 cash to an employee at a public aid office so that they would provide a fraudulent identification that Kelly and Aaliyah could use to obtain a marriage license. Kelly instead challenges the jury's determination regarding his knowledge of and intent with regard to the bribery. The government, however, presented sufficient evidence proving Kelly's complicity in and promotion and facilitation of the bribery screen. During trial, Smith testified that after landing in Chicago, the Kelly hit the the Kelly, okay. In Chicago, Kelly, his security guard, Tyree Jamison, his accountant and manager, McDavid, and others gathered in a hotel suite where Aaliyah was staying to discuss Kelly's plan to marry Aaliyah. During this discussion, Smith suggested to the group, which Smith testified included Kelly, that he could obtain a fraudulent identification. While Smith, who during his testimony made clear his close relationship with Kelly and his strong aversion to being subpoenaed to testify, attempted to minimize Kelly's knowledge and involvement in the scheme. When asked directly if Kelly was present, when Smith was suggesting to the group that you could get an ID from the welfare office if you paid some cash, Smith initially responded, I don't remember precisely each time, but I'm pretty sure he was there. After being confronted with his grand jury testimony, Smith ultimately responded yes to the question of whether Kelly was presented for the present for the conversation about bribing the employee official. This testimony alone was sufficient to prove Kelly's knowledge of how Smith obtained the identification. Now, I don't think Smith just said yes, period. I think Smith went on to say, yes, if that's what you say I said, then that's what I said. There was some foolishness like that. He didn't technically concede yes, period. 
So notwithstanding Kelly's claims to the contrary, the jury reasonably credited Smith's testimony when he stated that Kelly was present for the discussions regarding the plan to bribe the public aid employee. In addition to the content of Smith's testimony, the jury was able to view Smith's demeanor, mannerisms, and speech pattern during his testimony, information that is not readily apparent from the transcript. A rational juror viewing viewing Smith's testimony in its entirety could reasonably believe that during the times when Smith attempted to backtrack from prior statements, he was doing so in an effort to protect Kelly when faced with him in open court. It is squarely within the province of the jury to assess the witness's credibility in this way and to make reasonable inferences from their evaluation of the witness during testimony. So now they in the head of the jury telling us what the jury surmised when they were listening to Mitra Smith, who was up there acting like a damn crackhead or meth head or whatever his preferred uh, method of drugs is. So then there's a note at the bottom that says this is particularly true given that Smith consistently voiced his reluctance to testify. Yes, I don't want to be here, period. I was told that immunity was given to me, offered to me, but I didn't want to be here anyway. I don't feel like I did on this first prosecution for, so why do I have to testify here? And that he viewed the defendant to be just like my brother. In addition, the jury was also aware that Smith understood that his grant of immunity did not protect him against perjury or false statements at trial. Okay, then they go on to say United States versus Peyton, 2nd District, 1998, where there is conflicting testimony at trial, we defer to the jury's resolution of the witness's credibility. United States versus Eldridge, Western District of New York, August 28th, 2017, stating that when deciding a Rule 29 motion, a court must not assess witness credibility resolve inconsistent testimony against the verdict or otherwise weigh the significance of the evidence internal citation omitted why y'all keep omitting the internal citations i'm trying to understand do they want to make it hard to go back and find the information so the jury's assessment of smith's testimony was bolstered by the circumstantial evidence at trial Circumstantial, circumstantial, circumstantial. <sighs> Let's see here. Circumstantial evidence is direct evidence of a fight from which a person may reasonably infer the existence or non-existence of another fact. A person's guilt of a charged crime may be proven by circumstantial evidence if that evidence, let's see, let's see, oh, what was that, if that, because I'm reading another document, guys, but this is a long I didn't think this was going. There are two types of evidence, namely direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. In this case, the people contend that there is circumstantial evidence of the defendant's guilt. Let me explain what constitutes direct and circumstantial evidence and how they differ. Direct evidence is evidence of a fact based on a witness's personal knowledge of observation of that fact. A person's guilt of a charged crime may be proven by direct evidence if, standing alone, that evidence satisfies a jury beyond a reasonable doubt of the person's guilt of that crime. Circumstantial evidence is direct evidence of a fact from which a person may reasonably infer the existence of non -exist or non-existence of another fact. A person's guilt of a charged crime may be proven by circumstantial evidence if that evidence, while not directly establishing guilt, gives rise to an inference of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me give an example of the difference between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. 
Um, suppose that in a trial, one of the parties is trying to prove that it was raining on a certain morning. A witness testifies that on that morning, she walked to the subway and as she walked, she saw rain falling. She felt it striking her face and she heard it splashing on the sidewalk. That testimony of the witness's perception would be direct evidence that it rained on that morning. Suppose, on the other hand, the witness testified that it was clear as she walked to the subway that she went into the subway and got on the train and that while she was on the train, she saw passengers come in at one station after another carrying wet umbrellas and wearing wet clothes and raincoats. That testimony constitutes direct evidence of what the witness observed and because an inference that it was raining in the area would flow naturally, reasonably and logically from that direct evidence, the witness's testimony would constitute circumstantial evidence that it was raining in the area. The law does not distinct between circumstantial evidence and direct evidence in terms of weight of importance. Either type of evidence may be enough to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, depending on the facts of the case as the jury finds them to be. Because circumstantial evidence requires the drawing of inferences, I will explain the process involved in analyzing that evidence and what you must do before you may return a verdict of guilty based on solely the circumstantial evidence. And then the person who's writing this goes on to say, initially, you must decide on the basis of all the evidence what facts, if any, have been proven. Any facts upon which an evident inference of guilt can be drawn from must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. After you have determined what facts, if any, have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must decide what inferences, if any, can be drawn from those facts. Before you may draw an inference of guilt, however, that inference must be the only one that can fairly and reasonably be drawn from the facts. It must be consistent with the proven facts, and it must flow naturally, reasonably, and logically from them. Okay. And then um, again, it must appear that the inference of guilt is the only one that can fairly and reasonably be drawn from the facts and that the evidence excludes beyond a reasonable doubt every reasonable hypothesis of innocence. If there is a reasonable hypothesis from the proven facts consistent with the defendant's innocence, then you must find the defendant not guilty. If the only reasonable inference you find is that the defendant is guilty of a charged crime and that inference is established beyond reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant guilty of that crime. So that was a um, document talking about circumstantial evidence, as we know, and that's from the New York Courts.gov um, website. And we know that this case was full of circumstantial evidence where people are, you know, stating that, oh, because this happened with me or because I witnessed this, then that means that he's guilty of doing whatever. So the bad acts witnesses that came in to testify to say, oh, well, I had this experience. So that means that the charge crimes for these alleged victims has to be true because I experienced this. So I hope that makes sense. So then they go on to say the jury's assessment of Smith's testimony was bolstered by the circumstantial evidence at trial. As the government's proof made clear, Kelly orchestrated and participated in every aspect of the scheme from beginning to end. Kelly engaged in an inappropriate relationship and abused Aaliyah since she was at least approximately 13 or 14. Kelly, after learning that Aaliyah, and granted there was no testimony other than Javante Cunningham claiming that he had ever had sex with Aaliyah. I think she was the only one that came up with that story. So they did not prove that there was any abuse of Aaliyah in this case. And I really wish that the, the defense would have been able to raise the story because there are too many of us who remember that article that came out after this whole marriage story where it said that it was a publicity stunt. 
and they have wiped that from the internet because I know personally I read that article and it was in like Rolling Stone or one of those um, popular entertainment magazines back in the day, like Right On Magazine. Or like one of those, they had this story that this marriage was a publicity stunt and that's why there were no criminal charges. There was no criminal investigation because don't you think as widespread as that story was, that if they really believed that this man married this girl and was in an inappropriate relationship with her when she was 13 years old, they would not have arrested him at that point. Like this is just so crazy to me. But, you know, we digress and we're going to move on uh, with this document that they have. Um, it says, after learning that Leah believed that she might be pregnant, instructed Smith to arrange last minute flights to go to Chicago. Kelly, distraught and crying, told Smith that the plan would be for Kelly to marry Leah in order to avoid jail time. He did not tell Demetrius Smith that. <laughs> did he tell Demetrius Smith that? Because if he said that to Demetrius, then he was sharing what somebody else told him would be the way to get out of the situation. That was not his idea. So it says, Kelly, after Smith expressed his reservations about the plan, asked Kelly whose side he was on. I'm sorry. After Smith expressed his reservations about the plan, asked Smith whose side he was on. The money used to bribe the individual came from Kelly's accountant and manager who handled Kelly's coffers. Kelly drove with Smith and Aaliyah to the welfare office and the courier office. Did they omit the part where Demetrius said that he knew nothing about the bribe? Yeah, they conveniently, um, that he didn't know about the money that was paid to the employee or where the money came from. So they went to the welfare office and the courier office where Kelly's friend worked, staying behind in the car. If you guys followed my reading of the transcripts, you know, I shared with you that when I'm out at nighttime, like I'm in um, night air, <clears throat> it affects my vocal cords. So I do apologize for the issues I'm having with my voice this morning. But I was out last night. We were um, celebrating my granddaughter's birthday. <clears throat> and there's been like moisture in the air. So that's why my voice is messed up. So the money used, so they said that part, uh, Kelly knowing that Aaliyah was a minor and had not previously had identification showing she was 18, filled out a marriage application that contained the fraudulent information. Kelly was part of the group that went to speak with Kelly's friend and who put them in touch with the minister and, Ker and Kelly surreptitiously and illegally married Aaliyah in a suite in the airport hotel. The very reason Kelly needed the fraudulent identification document in the first place, the jury's finding was further supported by the overwhelming evidence adduced at trial that Kelly controlled every aspect of his affairs and virtually no decision, no matter how minuscule, was made without Kelly's knowledge and approval. Based on the fact that circumstantial evidence presented at trial, the jury reasonably could have inferred that it was inconceivable that Kelly had participated in, facilitated, and benefited from every aspect of the scheme, but the decision to bribe the public aid office employee. Such an inference was proper given all of the evidence presented and the court's instructions. A defendant's knowing, and then United States versus Aleska Rova, Second Circuit, 2002. A defendant's knowing and willing participation in a conspiracy may be inferred from, for example, her presence at critical stages of the conspiracy that could not be explained by happenstance or a lack of surprise when discussing the conspiracy with others. United States versus Mittendorf. Denying Rule 29 motion and nothing that it was eminently reasonable for the jury to infer from the evidence that the result of the conduct was obvious to all of those involved in the conspiracy. 
Mendorf Supra at citing United States versus Jackson, which was heard by the Second Circuit in 2003, deference to a jury's verdict is especially important to a conspiracy case because a conspiracy by its very nature is a secretive operation and it is a rare case where all aspects of a conspiracy can be laid bare in court with the precision of a surgeon's scalpel. Um, United States versus Bandrich, um, Southern District of New York, September 22nd, 2014, denying Rule 29 and Rule 33 motions stating that the prosecution may prove its case entirely by circumstantial evidence so long as guilt is established beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, but if you need circumstantial evidence to prove the guilt, that in and of itself is an issue because they had no real evidence in most of these charges against him. So given all the evidence viewed in the light most favorable to the government and deferring to the jury's assessment of witness credibility, a rational jury could and did find all the elements of Racketeering Act 1 proven, this finding should not be second guessed. Yes, it should, because you claim the man had a racketeering, had a enterprise that was racketeering worthy <laughs> for 30 years, but in that 30 years, you only had one instance where you claim he bribed somebody. Like, wouldn't bribery be a central focus in everything that he did to keep stuff under, you know, to keep, people from turning against him, like he's paying people off, paying people off, paying people off, but instead you have one instance that you claim he bribed somebody from, what, 1993, 1994, almost 30 years ago, one instance of bribery. So, <clears throat> there's a note at the bottom of this page, and it says, as the court properly instructed, it was not necessary for Kelly to have been the one to physically bribe the government employee. Actual physical presence at the commission of a crime is not a requirement for legal responsibility. And intent to promote or facilitate the commission of the offense may be shown by evidence that the defendant shared a criminal intent of the person who directly committed the offense or evidence that there was a common criminal design okay the bribery alleged is racketeering act one satisfied the vertical and horizontal relatedness elements notwithstanding kelly's conclusory assertion of the contrary and then it says in united states versus dayton the second circuit explained and then you guys know it's important for them to keep bringing up all these cases from the second circuit because the Second Circuit is where Jennifer Bungin will appeal to if she doesn't get um, respite from Judge Donnelly. She then has to go to the Second Circuit. So they're making sure to include as many Second Circuit cases as they can to show the Second Circuit. See, see you had previous cases where you sided with the government. So you need to refer to these cases when you're reviewing their appeal. But there's probably hundreds of other cases where the Second Circuit ruled in favor of the defendant where there were different rulings to support their decisions. But they're trying to reinforce to the Second Circuit in this document that, hey, this is what you said about this case, about this case, about this case. And Bonjean could probably come up with, like I say, could find the cases where they thought otherwise based on the individual case. Like all of these cases that they are citing have nothing to do with the charges against Mr. Kelly, but they're citing those. So when the Second Circuit came up with those decisions or any of these court decisions, regardless of where the case was heard, they are applying their opinions to the specific acts in that case. Case. So when they're looking at this case, they will be looking at the specific facts and not comparing it to, oh, well, this bank was, we ruled against this bank 10 years ago when the bank charges have nothing to do with the charges in this case. So they're explaining that the Second Circuit made this um, statement in this case against Dayton or 
yeah, Dayton, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, this court has further developed this requirement of relatedness, holding that predicate acts must be related to each other, horizontal relatedness, and they must be related to the enterprise, vertical relatedness, to show that the predicate acts are vertically related to the RICO enterprise, the government must establish, one, that the defendant was enabled to commit the predicate offenses solely by virtue of his position in the enterprise or involvement in or control over the affairs of the enterprise, or two, that the predicate offenses are related to the activities of that enterprise. One way to show that predicate acts horizontally related to each other is to show that each predicate act is related to the RICO enterprise. Accordingly, the requirements of horizontal relatedness can be established by linking each predicate act to the enterprise, although the same or similar proof may also establish vertical relatedness. So they put all this jargon in there, but they don't tell us what the predicate acts were. What, what, what exactly did the person that you're talking about, what did they do in whatever their criminal charge was? You see what I'm saying? So they're just taking these broad statements and applying it to the Kelly case when these statements were for something that somebody else did. Like this person could have worked at a bank and was funneling money to a shareholder, allowing a shareholder to funnel money through the bank. You know, when I was talking about like the money laundering thing, but Mr. Kelly wasn't charged with money laundering. So why are you comparing a money laundering case to his case? Seemed like they would try to find other cases similar to uh, what they charged Mr. Kelly with the exact acts and then say, oh, the second circuit ruled against this person in their appeal but instead they're pulling cases that have no correlation no relation in the specific charges or the specific acts that were committed that brought about their charges so then they go on um and say internal quotation marks and citations omitted the bribery easily satisfies and they're talking about the same case the bribery easily satisfies the vertical and horizontal relatedness requirements as set forth above. Kelly was able to commit the bribery solely by virtue of his position in the enterprise. Put another way, to commit the bribery, Kelly relied upon his inner circle members of the charged enterprise, including his tour manager and accountant. In addition, the bribery was committed for the same purpose as the other racketeering acts, namely, to allow Kelly to abuse women and girls and otherwise commit illegal sexual activity. And then they cite um, H.J. Incorporation versus Northwest Bell Telephone Company, a case from 1989. Relatedness prong may be satisfied by proof that the predicate acts have the same or similar purposes, results, participants, victims, or methods of commission or otherwise are interrelated by distinguishing characteristics and are not isolated events. But this is an isolated event because this was the only charge of bribery that you came up with. And then I'm going to go back up here because there was a note on the previous page and it says the defendants claim that as far as defendant New Smith obtained the identification from a friend who worked in the public aid office holds no weight given the evidence at trial, nor is the government required to preclude every reasonable hypothesis which is consistent with innocence. United States versus Chang and Lowe. Second Circuit, 1988, internal citation omitted. Let's see. Okay. Then it says, finally, Kelly's claim that Racketeering Act 1 is barred by the statute of limitations demonstrates a fundamental and continued misunderstanding of RICO. The statute of limitations for a substantive RICO offense, the offense charged in count one, is five years from the date of the indictment, 
No person shall be prosecuted, tried, or punished by any offense, not capital, unless the indictment is found within five years next after such offense shall have been committed. The statute of limitations is not measured, as the defendant suggests, from the date of the first racketeering act. This is so because the defendant is charged with committing a particular predicate act, but rather with committing racketeering through a pattern of racketeering acts. Under the law, in the substantive RICO charge under section 1962C, the defendant must have committed at least one predicate act within five years of the date of the indictment. United States versus Persico, Second Circuit 1987, to establish a defendant's violation of Section 1962C, the government must prove that the defendant committed two or more predicate offenses, at least one of which occurred within the federal five-year statute of limitations for non-capital offenses. Citation omitted again. Because this indictment was filed on June 20, 2019, at least one of the predicate racketeering acts charged against the defendant in the substantive RICO count must have occurred or continued past June 20, 2014. In this case, racketeering acts 8 through 14 all occurred after that date, and there is thus no statute of limitations issue in this case and you guys remember i've told you before that it was important for them to charge the asriel and faith rogers alleged crimes that they claim were committed in this indictment because without faith and asriel they had no rico because there was nothing that they could find to muster up or create within the past five years and in order to pull all this other stuff up, which to me is criminal within itself that you would trump up charges and then you can then go back years and decades to bring up other stuff from the past to create this RICO against a person. So to me, like that needs to be reviewed because that makes absolutely no sense. And let me see, there was a note... Before I continue, there was a note on the page that I'm leaving. It says the court previously rejected a similar claim raised by the defendant in a pretrial motion to dismiss. And then they, um, it was dated October 26, 2021. And then they give the docket number. So continuing on. Um, to establish a defendant's violation of section 1962, the government must prove that a defendant committed two or more predicate acts. Okay, so now they're going to get into, so two, production of sexually explicit material. Racketeering acts 2, 7, and 10 charge Kelly with sexual exploitation in violation of United States Code 182251A with respect to Stephanie, Geronda, and Azriel, respectively, to convict a defendant of a violation of United States Code 182251A, the government must prove three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, the victim was less than 18. The defendant, two, the defendant used, employed, persuaded, induced, enticed, or coerced the minor to take part in sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing a visual depiction of that conduct. Um, he did not employ, he did not persuade, induce, entice, or coerce. They seem to have been quite willing to do it. Three, the visual depiction was produced using materials that had been transported in interstate or foreign commerce. United States versus Broxmeyer, Second Circuit 2010. Internal quotation marks and citation omitted. Kelly focuses primarily on the second element, challenging the jury's findings as to racketeering acts 2, 7, and 10 by arguing that he did nothing to persuade, induce, entice, or coerce the victim witnesses into the sexual activity that was recorded, of which y'all didn't even have the damn videos to prove that they even existed. Notably, his argument, and so right there, I think we got ineffective counsel because they should have been challenging the fact that there were no videos that were shown. 
So notably, his argument conveniently omits any reference to the fact that the second element may be proven by showing that the defendant used or employed the minor to take part in sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing a visual depiction of that conduct, as the court properly instructed the jury. As to the second element, the words used, employed, persuaded, induced, and enticed are words of common usage. You should interpret these words by using your own common sense. The words persuade, induce, and entice are in effect synonyms that convey the idea of leading or moving another person by persuasion as to some action, state of mind, etc., or to bring about, produce, or cause. So let me break this down for y'all. So say I'm sitting in the house, minding my own business, okay, watching television, doing my YouTube videos or whatever. And then someone comes or a friend comes over and says, hey, girl, come go to the store with me. And so I'm like, I don't want to go to the store. Oh, girl, come on. You know, we can talk about whatever because I want to catch you up on what I did last night. And so I said, okay, girl, let me get my shoes. I'll come on out and go to the store with you. So while we're at the store, my friend goes in and I stay in the car. But my friend goes in or I may have gotten out of the car and went in the store with her. So then she steals something. She shoplifts or whatever. I know nothing about her shoplifting, right? But because I was in the store <laughs> with her, I get charged with the, I'm there. So then I testify against the, I don't get charged. I testify for the government that, yeah, you know, I was with her and she stole these items. And then they can create a RICO by saying that my friend enticed me persuaded me to go to the store with her. So now we can make this a RICO case because other people are part of this criminal case. So we're not just gonna charge her with petty theft of shoplifting a candy bar from the 7-Eleven. Instead, we're gonna make this a RICO case because in the past she's been charged with shoplifting. So let's just make it a federal RICO case and send her to jail you know, for life instead of giving her probation that she's gotten in the past. And then here we can prove that there's a RICO because she coerced this person to go with her to commit this crime. So I'm just giving it to you guys in the most simplistic form. And even though it sounds irrational that any of this could happen, they are proving to us just how manipulative the government is when it comes to charging people with crimes. So then it goes on to say the Second Circuit has made clear that the word used in this context encompasses a scenario where a child is photographed in order to create porn. United States versus Seros and see also Ortiz Grula versus United States um, First Circuit 2014 holding that the statutory definition of use is met when a defendant makes a minor the subject of a visual depiction by intentionally photographing the minor engaging in explicit conduct. United States versus Wright, 6th Circuit, 2014. United States versus McLeod, 8th Circuit, 2009. A defendant uses a minor for purposes of 2251A if he photographs, and it should be he or she, photographs the minor engaging in explicit conduct to create a visual depiction of such conduct. Um, United States versus Engel, 4th Circuit, 2012, quoting McLeod. As a result, Kelly is simply wrong when he states with no citation to any precedent that the government must prove that defendant did something more than just film the explicit conduct or a minor to meet the second element. Indeed, the Second Circuit has long held there is no reason to assume that the use of a minor must occur before the filming of photographing of illicit sexual activity. No temporal limitation is implicit in any of the meanings that the word use ordinarily has, nor is one indicated in the surrounding statute or case law. Although some of the other actions listed in 2251A, such as enticing, inducing, and persuading, will most often occur before the depicted activity, that is not so of the word use. 
and we find no indication in the statute that Congress meant to import a temporal limitation into the term in this context. Okay, then they're back to Kelly. Clearly used Stephanie, Geronda, and Azrael to take part in sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing a visual depiction of that conduct. His argument to the contrary should be summarily rejected. Nor was the jury erroneously instructed by the court with respect to these racketeering acts. The court correctly read each racketeering act to the jury, which language made clear that each act charged the defendant with using the relevant victim to engage in sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing one or more visual depictions of such act and correctly told the jury that United States Code 18-2251A provides in pertinent part that any person who employs, uses, persuades, induces, entices, or coerces any minor to engage in any sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing, okay, basically we just read that a few minutes ago, if that, if that visual depiction was produced using materials that have been mailed, shipped, or transported in, trans, in interstate or foreign commerce by any means, including by computer, or if the visual depiction was actually been transported in interstate or foreign commerce or mailed. Okay. So basically what they're saying there is... They're claiming that he made these depictions on this iPad, which I don't understand how he made depictions of Stephanie on the iPad because the iPad wasn't even made at that point. But so I guess by carrying the iPad with him when he traveled and went anywhere, that that was interstate commerce. And the fact that he bought the iPad and the iPad had to be shipped to him, that that's also interstate commerce. So... Y'all out here making these videos in y'all houses with this recording equipment that y'all done bought off of Amazon or either one of these um, Best Buy or somewhere like that. Um, y'all better be careful, okay, because that's interstate commerce. And then your person that you was making the video with could come back later and say that you were part of a racketeering case because... Um, you recorded all of your sexual encounters with multiple people on this iPad, and therefore it is interstate commerce. So with respect to Racketeering Act 2, the court then instructed the jury on the elements of this offense and various definitions of terms used those elements, which it referred back to when instructing the jury on Racketeering Act 7 and 10. With respect to the elements, the court instructed the jury to prove that the defendant committed this racketeering act, the government must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that Stephanie was under the age of 18 at the time of the acts alleged in the indictment. Second, that the defendant used, employed, persuaded, induced, or enticed Stephanie to take part in sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing or transmitting a visual depiction of that conduct. Third, that the visual depiction was produced using materials that had been mailed, shipped, or transported in and affecting interstate and foreign commerce. While the court included language here regarding transmitting a visual depiction of that conduct, which relates to a portion of 2251A that was not charged in these racketeering acts, it did not do so to the exclusion of correctly instructing the juror as to the production purpose of the charged conduct, as apparently suggested by the defendant. Given that, as Kelly himself concedes, the government presented no evidence regarding the transmission of live visual depictions at trial, the court's inclusion of the surplus or transmitting language did not mislead the jury or affect its verdict, particularly where, as here, both the language of the racketeering acts themselves and the relevant portion of the statute read by the court to the jury made clear that the indictment only charged the production purpose of the visual depictions and not any purpose to transmit such visual depictions. 
Put another way, the court's jury instructions, though they contain irrelevant additional language, <laughs> were legally correct. And two, the evidence at trial clearly established that Kelly used Stephanie Geronda and Azriel respectively to engage in explicit conduct for the purpose of producing a visual depiction of such conduct. Viewed as a whole, the court's instructions thus included all the essential elements of the offense and adequately informed the jury of the law. United States v. al Kasser or Kazar, Second Circuit, um, 2011, Viewed as a whole, the jury instruction adequately instructed the jury as to all factual findings required to support conviction. Therefore, the instruction did not mislead the jury and was not erroneous, let alone plainly so. Internal quotation marks and citations omitted. Hathaway v. Coughlin, 2nd Circuit, 1996. Jury instructions not erroneous if, taken as a whole and viewed in light of the evidence, the charge shows no tendency to confuse or mislead the jury as to principles of law which are applicable. applicable. Finally, Kelly's argument that the government failed to prove the interstate commerce element of the offense, namely that the visual depictions at issue were produced using, visual, using materials that had been mailed, shipped, or transported in and affecting interstate and foreign commerce lacks merit. With respect to Stephanie, the government proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Kelly produced a visual depiction in Illinois by using a video camera to record the visual depiction on a VHS tape. The government further proved by stipulation that one, a component part of all VHS tapes is polyester film and two in and before 1999 all of the entities that manufactured the polyester film used in all vhs tapes were located outside the state of illinois and manufactured polyester film outside the state of illinois with respect to geronda the government proved that kelly produced the visual depictions of Okay, so they had Government Exhibit 1006, and that was the information, the technical information. Wasn't no video, but the technical information <laughs> explaining where this uh, polyester film was not, where it was actually produced, showing that it was outside of Illinois. So with respect to Geronda, the government proved that Kelly produced the visual depictions of Geronda in Illinois using an Apple iPhone and a Canon camera both of which were manufactured outside the state of Illinois. Government Exhibit 1006, with respect to Azriel, the government proved that Kelly produced visual depictions of Jane throughout the United States, including in Chicago, Atlanta, and California, using an iPad, which was manufactured outside of the United States. Government Ex Exhibit 957, Based on this evidence, a reasonable jury could find beyond a reasonable doubt that the sexually explicit visual de depictions of Stephanie, Geronda, and Jane were all produced using materials that had been transported in interstate commerce. United States versus Jubert, um, VHS First Circuit 2015, VHS tape made out of state sufficient to satisfy interstate commerce element in possession of CP, United States versus Dunlap, um, 8th Circuit 2006, use of a camera and film that had traveled in interstate commerce satisfies interstate commerce element for production of CP, United States versus Chamber, 6th Circuit 2006, Polaroid film produced in either Massachusetts or the Netherlands, provided sufficient interstate foreign commerce nexus and CP possession case, um, United States versus Paul, Utah, November 19, 2015, use of iPhone manufactured outside Utah to produce CP satisfies interstate commerce, United States versus Winningham, uh, Minnesota, 1996 possession of photographs of cp taken using film manufactured in another state alone provides sufficient nexus to interstate commerce 
three, man act violations, exposure to an STD. Kelly challenges the sufficiency of the evidence proving the violations of the Mann Act based on exposure to a sexually transmitted disease. Specifically, Kelly first argues that the government failed to prove Racketeering Acts 8A and 12A because with respect to Azrael and Faith respectively, there was insufficient evidence to prove that Kelly transported either of them with the intent of exposing them to herpes. He also similarly argues that there was insufficient proof of Racketeering Acts 8B and 12B that Kelly persuaded, induced, enticed, or coerced Faith to travel to New York with the intent of exposing her to herpes, and that he did not persuade, induce, entice, or coerce Azriel to travel to California in April and May 15 at all. Finally, Kelly argues that the evidence was insufficient to prove that he committed violations of California health and safety code or the New York penal law, penal law and New York public health law beyond a reasonable doubt. A. Racketeering Acts 8A and 12A intent. As the court correctly instructed the jury in order to establish the necessary intent for a violation of United States Code 182421A, it is not necessary for the government to prove that engaging in illegal activity was the only purpose for crossing the state line. A person may have several different purposes or motives for such travel, and each may prompt in various, varying degrees the act of making the journey. The government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt, however, that a significant or motivating purpose of the travel across a state line was that the defendant would engage in illegal sexual activity with the victim in other words, that illegal activity must not have been merely incidental to the trip. United States versus Hayward, Third Circuit in 2004, approving virtually identical language in jury charge for violation of USC 182423A, which criminalizes transportation of a minor with intent to engage in illegal activity and includes identical intent intent language from section 2421a c united states versus maxwell southern district of new york december 19 2021 using virtually identical language in jury charge for violation of united states code 18 24 23 a kelly okay let me stop there because there's a long note at the bottom and we'll read that before we continue notably the defendant asserts wrongly that the ninth and tenth circuits have held that the government must prove that the illegal activity is the dominant significant or motivating purpose behind the transportation and misleadingly suggests that there is a circuit split regarding this issue in fact, the cases cited by the defendant for the proposition do not so hold. In United States versus Kinslow, the Ninth Circuit explicitly recognized that a defendant may have more than one purpose for transporting an individual and only one of the dominant purposes need be for illegal sexual activity. And that was in the Ninth Circuit in 1988. Um, over emphasis added and then they have overruled on other grounds see also united states lakashov ninth circuit 2012 holding that defendant's stated purpose of traveling to new york and back to oregon to pick up and deliver goods in his capacity as a long-haul truck driver did not mean the did not mean the requisite intent was not established at trial because it ignores the human ability and propensity to act in light of multiple motives and purposes only one of which needed to be a dominant significant or motivating purpose to engage in illegal activity that the defendant also had a commercial purpose for crossing state lines does not negate the inference that he had a significant or motivating purpose to continue engaging in sexual activity with the victim emphasis added similarly in united states versus crier the 10th circuit made clear that transportation for the purpose of illegal activity 
need not be the sole reason for transportation, not need it not need it be the most important or defendant's reasons. When multiple purposes are present, it need only be a motive or dominant purpose. Um, emphasis added 10th Circuit 2000. Thus, it is clear that the 9th and 10th Circuit's decisions are in line with the court's instructions here that the illegal sexual activity need only be a motivating or significant purpose of the travel, nor is the defendant correct that the 2nd Circuit does not seem to have answered the intent question. In United States v. Vargas Condon, Cordon, while discussing identical intent language in Let's scroll down, child, because this thing go on and on and on. Um, United States Code 1824-23A, the Second Circuit made clear that the con contemplating unlawful sexual activity need not be the defendant's sole purpose for transporting a minor in interstate or foreign commerce. And I don't even know why they got faith included in this, because she was definitely not a minor. Rather, it must only be a dominant purpose of the transportation. This can include being one of multiple dominant purposes. A jury need only find that illegal sexual activity was one of the dominant motives for the interstate transportation and not merely an incident of the transportation. Internal quotation marks and citations omitted. Okay, the portion, then note number 18, the portion of the trial transcript cited by the defendant to assert that the purpose of the defendant's travel to California had nothing to do with Azriel, but rather was because the defendant had shows there, refers to a California trip that took place after the conduct charged in Racketeering Act 8, which charges conduct in or about and between the end of April and May 2015. During the quoted portion of her testimony, Azrael was testifying about trips to California that occurred after her initial trip there in the spring of 2015. Okay, let me see if that continues down on the next page before I continue. Okay. So what I was just reading, the notes that I was just reading is where they are addressing things that was in Bunjing's motion. Now if I can get back to where I was before all that started. Okay, now picking back up. It says, Kelly argues that the illegal sexual activity alleged in these racketeering acts was incidental to the trips. While Kelly was certainly free to make such an argument to the jury and in fact did so, based on the evidence presented at trial, the jury was entitled to find otherwise in this regard, the relevant question is not, as suggested by Kelly, whether he traveled to California in the spring of 2015 to perform at shows or that he had the intent to infect Azrael with herpes. Rather, the relevant question is whether one of Kelly's motivating purposes in transporting Azrael to California was to engage in unprotected sex with Azrael without first informing her that he had contracted herpes and obtaining her consent to sexual intercourse in those circumstances. As to that question, the government presented sufficient evidence for a reasonable jury to reach that conclusion. Kelly's medical records and testimony from his doctor, Dr. Chris McGrath, among other things, established that the defendant had contracted genital herpes at some point after June 2000 and before March 19, 20, 2007, and that Dr. McGrath had informed the defendant of this diagnosis and unequivocally told the defendant to perform his sex to inform his sexual partners that he had herpes and to use a condom during intercourse. There was also an overwhelming evidence showing that notwithstanding what Kelly told Azriel, Kelly's motivating purpose in spending time with Azriel was to engage in sexual activity with her. And I don't think that they um Wait, let me go, wait. Okay, Azrael testified that the very first time she met Kelly in Florida at the Dolphin Hotel, he told her that before she could audition for him, he needed to come or ejaculate and continuously tried to peer pressure her. Child, how is it peer pressure <laughs> when they are not peers, okay? 
to have sex with him. Ultimately, after Azrael continued to decline, Kelly asked Azrael to at least just let him lick her butt. In return, he promised to allow Azrael to audition and to take care of her for life. Thereafter, Kelly licked Azrael's butt before being interrupted by a knock at the door of his hotel room by officers. And then this is all hearsay because there was no proof that any of this happened. Like they are just going on these stories that these people are telling with no proof to bike up that that particular thing actually happened. After he ejaculated, Kelly allowed Ezreal to sing for him. Thereafter, Kelly told Ezreal that he wanted her to travel to see him and that he would teach her a few techniques. Um, I think he was talking about music, but anyway. The two then continued to communicate by phone. A few days after their meeting at the Dolphin Hotel, Kelly asked Azrael to send him a video of her singing in her underwear and bra, which she did. He also, I thought she sent, the mama sent that. I'm so confused. Uh, anyway. He also gave Azrael the phone number for his assistant, Cheryl Mike, and told Azrael to text Mike so that Mike could tra make travel arrangements for Azriel to come to see Kelly. Okay, and I also want to point out that when they're talking about the text message that he allegedly sent, telling her to send the thing in um, the paintings and bra, they don't have an exhibit listed, which meant that they don't actually have those text messages. That's what I'm taking this as. Because they didn't list the government exhibit that would show that. He also gave Azrael the phone number for his assistant so that Mike could make travel arrangements for Azrael to come see Kelly while he was on tour in California. Um, on April 28, 2015, Azrael sent a text message to Mike stating, Mr. Kelly said to get me to LA an early flight my name is Azriel. I'm in Orlando, Florida currently and provided Mike with her true date of birth, December 30th, 1997. And then they have a government exhibit showing that text message. Mike then arranged for Azriel to travel to Los Angeles the following day and Azriel flew from Orlando, Florida to Los Angeles, which travel was paid for by Kelly. And then they have that government exhibit after her arrival in Los Angeles, Azrael saw Kelly in his hotel room. Kelly told Azrael that he wanted to teach her a few musical techniques. However, he needed to ejaculate again before doing anything. Wait, hold on. I lost my place there. Before doing anything and thereafter gave Azrael oral sex. After Los Angeles, Cheryl Mike arranged for Azrael to travel to Stockton, California on May 2015. And then we have a government exhibit of the actual travel information, but we ain't got no exhibits proving none of these things that Azrael is saying in her stories. After attending Kelly's concert in Stockton that evening, Azrael saw Kelly at a hotel room in Stockton where she had sexual intercourse vaginal penetration with him no exhibit proof kelly did not use a condom and did not say anything to azrael about his having an std thereafter in the summer of 2015 azrael traveled to spend time with kelly in chicago and atlanta and the two had sex almost every day according to azrael while the two engaged in sexual contact kelly would basically control exactly every single time they were intimate, meaning that he would say everything specifically and Azriel would have to follow exactly what he said. Kelly never told Azriel that he had previously been diagnosed with herpes and never used a condom during sex. From this evidence, the jury could reasonably conclude that one of Kelly's motivating reasons for arranging for Azriel to travel to see him in California in April and May of 2015 was so that he could have sexual intercourse with her and do so in the manner he always did with Azriel and his other sexual partners 
who testified at trial, namely without a condom and without first informing her that he had contracted herpes. Let's see. The same is true for Faith. Faith testified that after meeting Kelly at a concert in San Antonio in March 2017, she began communicating with him regularly and he arranged for her to travel to see him on various occasions between May 2017 and February 2018. At no point during that time period from March 17, 2017 through the last time Faith traveled to see the defendant in February 2018, did the defendant tell Faith that he had herpes? Hey, why can't I? There's this thing jumping all over the place. Hold on. Okay. And at no point during his sexual interactions with Faith did he wear a condom, including during sexual intercourse. In May 2017, after attending Kelly's concert the night before in Long Island, Kelly showed up at Faith's hotel room at 6 a.m. and almost immediately stripped down from his waist down and told Faith to take her clothes off. Hmm. Um, my thing is jumping all over the place. My cursor is jumping all over the place. Okay. Okay, May Faith told at 6 a.m. Waist down to Faith to take her clothes off. Asking her to come rub on daddy, referring explicitly to his penis. When Faith began massaging his shoulders, Kelly moved her hand onto his penis and told her to rub there. Faith told Kelly she was not ready for sex, and Kelly responded that he was at his best when he was wanted. Thereafter, Kelly instructed Faith to get on the bed on her bike on all fours. And I ain't figured that one out yet. How you get on your bike on all fours? Like, how does that... That's like a... Remember that thing we used to do as kids where you would lay on your bike and then you would put your... What do they call it? Oh my God, you would lift your body up so your body was like arched. Is that what he told Faith to do? Because I'm just not understanding this maneuver that was going on. So anyway, child, I say thereafter, okay, blah, 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 on fours and started rubbing her and then stuck his fingers inside of her in a manner that Faith felt like she was being examined by an OBGYN. Kelly then began to give Faith oral from behind and... After a brief pause, told Faith to flip over, which she did, and he continued to give her oral. Thereafter, Kelly started to get ready to penetrate Faith, and she asked him, are you going to use a condom? To which Kelly replied, we don't need a condom. Then that should have been Faith's clue to get her butt up and get dressed, okay? Kelly then penetrated Faith with his penis and directed Faith on what to say and how to moan while recording the encounter on a nearby Apple iPad. Once again, we don't have an exhibit here. Um, there were a few times where Kelly paused because Faith wasn't getting aroused and it was kind of like difficulties with him getting inside of Faith. After Kelly finished, he let out a sigh of disappointment and told Faith there was a lot she had to learn when it comes to sex. <laughs> Although I always feel so sorry for Faith when they be um, repeating the fact that she was unable to please him. So after a brief conversation concerning Faith's age, Kelly, quote, put on his clothes, got his backpack and left. After, end quote, after other than stay in her hotel room at the defendant's direction, Faith did nothing else for the remainder of the trip and did not see the defendant again during the trip. So this is basically the same stuff that I read to you all in my previous <laughs> video. They're just reiterating these sexual encounters, the different places that she met him um, in Chicago in June 2017, Dallas in December 2017, Los Angeles in January 2018, New York, February 2018. And remember I told y'all he only physically saw Faith like five or six times throughout this supposed relationship and they say on each of those occasions the defendant intended to engage in sexual intercourse with faith indeed the chicago 
Within less than five minutes of first seeing her, Faith told Kelly told Faith to take off her clothes and pulled his penis out. After Faith told Kelly she was on her period, he told Faith to suck on Daddy and pulled her neck down to start giving him oral, which was then, which she did for approximately 30 minutes. Lord Jesus. This encounter began about 10 minutes after Faith had arrived at Kelly's studio from the airport and as discussed above, less than five minutes after the defendant first saw her in Chicago. Kelly then sent Faith to buy lingerie at a local mall and did not see her again during his trip to Chicago, <laughs> from which the jury could certainly infer that Kelly no longer had an interest in seeing again during this trip because she had told him she had her period and given that would not engage in sexual intercourse with her. In Dallas, Kelly engaged in sexual intercourse with Faith at the concert venue before his show without a condom and without first informing her he had herpes. After the concert and a period of time when Faith was backstage with Diana Copeland, Faith returned to her hotel and went to sleep. Approximately two hours later, Faith was awoken by knocking on the door. Kelly came inside and engaged in sexual intercourse with Faith, again without a condom and without his informing her he had herpes. At the end of the trip, Kelly informed Faith that he was dismayed that when he had sex with her, he had difficulty getting his penis fully inside her and told Faith she needed to get a dildo that was the size of his penis and she needed to start using it so that he doesn't have any problems when they are having sex. Sound like two people in a consensual relationship to me, okay? In Los Angeles, Faith first saw Kelly at a recording studio after being told by Diana Copeland to wait in a Sprinter van outside for hours and then in a room within the studio. After about 15 minutes, Kelly jogged into the room, got something, said hey, and left the room. Faith then waited several hours in the room before Kelly returned again. Shortly after his return, Kelly told Faith to take off her clothes and walk back and forth. Faith again told Kelly she was on her period, though this time she did not actually have a period. Faith lied to Kelly about having her period because she did not want to have sex. Upon learning that Faith had her period, Kelly sighed and said, well, why did you come? Faith responded, you wouldn't want me to come just because I was on my period. You wouldn't want me to come just because I was on my period. And Kelly nodded his head. He then told Faith to take off her pants and had her walk back and forth in the bodysuit she was wearing. Later, as described, he forced Faith to give him oral sex. Okay, finally, when Faith traveled to New York City in February 2018, she arrived at the Mandarin Hotel around 1 a.m. and stayed in Kelly's hotel suite. The suite was empty when she arrived and Kelly knocked on the door around 8 a.m. while Faith was sleeping. Immediately after she opened the door to the suite, Kelly told Faith she was going to have to get used to his schedule and told her to get her clothes off, which she did. Kelly then asked Faith to hug and kiss him and thereafter retrieved his iPad and told Faith to pose, after which he complained that she wasn't being sexy. He then told Faith to play with herself and when she did not do so, he sighed with dissatisfaction. Kelly then asked um, Faith to lie down on the bed on her bike and after the defendant masturbated briefly, he began to penetrate Faith, putting his penis into her vagina. Faith clenched her body on purpose and Kelly became frustrated, started grunting, told Faith to relax and got upset when she did not do so. Finally frustrated and upset, Kelly got up, retrieved his iPad to watch sexual content on it and began masturbating at high speed manner. When he finished, Kelly told Faith she needed to be like the two women in the sex video he had just watched on his iPad. Kelly then ordered room service, asked Faith to rub his back, and subsequently fell asleep a few minutes later. Thereafter, Diana Copeland entered the suite and informed the defendant that he had a meeting he was late for, and the defendant quickly got dressed. Before leaving, however, Kelly gave Faith constructive criticism about her sexual positions. The defendant did not use a condom or inform Faith that he had herpes prior to having sexual intercourse. And there were no exhibits anywhere in that testimony. So this is basically hearsay. It's Faith, well not even really hearsay, but just Faith's version of what happened bases nothing. <laughs> okay, she just sitting there telling the story. I guess he could have got on the stand and been like, that bitch lying. Okay, 
None of that happened. And then that would be his version of the story. So given this course of events over five trips, including Kelly's reaction to learn that Faith purportedly had her period in Los Angeles, a reasonable jury could certainly um, conclude that a motivating purpose of having Faith travel to see him in Los Angeles and elsewhere included two trips to New York was to have sexual intercourse. Now, the problem with that is that Faith was calling him, asking him to fly her to these different places. And so I guess he assumed because Faith wanted to come and he had showed no other interest in her at all that she was going there to have sex. That Because I don't think he ever would have contacted Faith if Faith hadn't contacted him. And they seem to be leaving out those parts. So B, racketeering acts 8B and 12B, persuasion, inducement, enticement, or coercion um, with this help of Azrael. Kelly argues that with respect to Racketeering Act 8B, the record is devoid of evidence that Kelly persuaded, induced, enticed, or coerced Azrael to travel to California in April and May 2015, as described above. However, the trial evidence showed that following the very first encounter at the Dolphin Hotel in, Ho in Florida, Kelly allowed Azrael, an aspiring professional singer, to audition for him. And then Kelly told Azrael he wanted her to travel to see him on tour, promising to teach her a few singing techniques. In subsequent phone conversations, he provided Azrael with contact information for his assistant, Cheryl Mike, um, to make travel arrangements. Azrael did so, and Mike arranged for travel to, from Florida to Los Angeles and then other locations in California. Okay, so they've already said this. As the Second Circuit has recognized, um, persuade, induce, entice, and coerce are words of common usage that have plain and ordinary meanings. Um, United States versus Wakar, Second Circuit 2021. Internal quotation marks omitted. Contrary to Kelly's suggestion, the ordinary means of those verbs do not include as a necessary element the overbearing or transformation of another's will. Indeed, a person may lead or move another by persuasion or influence to take an action to which she is already predisposed, predisposed or neutral. A jury applying the common and plain meanings of the statutory terms to Kelly's conduct could thus readily conclude that Kelly persuaded, induced, and enticed Azrael to travel to California with false promises of assisting her with her singing technique and by arranging and paying for her travel. Regardless of whether she expressed or felt reluctance, indifference, or for that matter, enthusiasm at the prospect of doing so. United States versus Zupnik, 8th Circuit, 2021, recognizing in the context of a violation of United States Code 1824-22B that a defendant can be found to persuade or entice even a seemingly willing minor, quoted approvingly in Waquar, at a minimum, such conduct, and then they just cut the damn sentence off, at a minimum, such conduct amounts to inducement, which simply means to cause, which is all that is required of the statute. The requisite, and then they talk about harms versus United States, Fourth Circuit from 1959, the requisite inducement is any offer sufficient to cause the woman to respond and that since the appellate knowingly induced or persuaded the victim to make the trip, then she knowingly caused the victim to travel by interstate carrier within the meaning of the statute. Then faith. Kelly similarly argues that insufficient evidence exists to prove that defendant took any action to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce faith into traveling to New York because the evidence shows that he invited a grown woman to meet him in New York and she accepted. This argument fails for the same reasons. Based on the evidence set forth, including that Kelly invited Kate to faith to see him and arranged and paid for the travel, the jury could reasonably conclude that Kelly induced her to travel to New York to engage in intercourse with her in the manner in which he always engaged in intercourse with her as well as other sex partners. Without using a condom, without first, girl, they, I'm talking about girl, y'all, they just go keep drilling this uh, without 
informing these fools that he had herpes. Then they cite um, United States versus Waskowski, Ninth Circuit, 2002, finding that defendants offered to make and pay for necessary travel arrangements to allow his two victims to travel from Russia to the United States and the fact that the victims accepted defendants' offer and thereafter traveled with his assistance was sufficient evidence from which a rational, a rational jury can conclude that the defendant persuaded, induced, or enticed them to travel. But what was the case about? United States versus Pelton, 8th Circuit, 1978, concluding the defendant had induced a woman to travel by making her travel arrangements, even though the woman had been willing to travel to work as a prostitute. Okay, C, Penal Work Law, New York. Lord, I'm, I'm delirious, y'all. <laughs> C, New York Penal Law 120.20. Kelly argues that the evidence was insufficient to prove violations of New York Penal Law 120.20 because unprotected sex with someone who has genital herpes does not establish a substantial risk of serious physical injury. Section 120.20 provides that a person is guilty of reckless endangerment in the second degree when he recklessly engages in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious physical injury to another person. As the New York Court of Appeals has made clear, the reckless endangerment statutes seek to prevent the risk created by the actor's conduct, not a particular outcome, and the risk of injury alone will sustain prosecution. People v. Galatro, New York, 1994, internal quotations, quotation marks omitted, emphasis added, meaning that they have changed the wording as it actually appeared. Um, each of the Challenge Man Act violations alleges that the defendant violated New York Penal Law Section 120.20 and New York Public Health Law Section 2307 in that he engaged in unprotected sexual intercourse with Faith without first informing Faith that he had contracted herpes and obtaining her consent to sexual intercourse in these circumstances. The conduct alleged in the indictment and proven at trial clearly constitutes reckless endangerment in the second degree. As the court properly instructed the jury, a person recklessly engages in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious physical injury to another person. One, when he engages in conduct which creates a substantial and unjustifiable risk of serious physical injury to another person. Two, when he is aware of and consciously disregards that risk and three when that risk is of such nature and degree that disregard of it constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of conduct that a reasonable person would observe in the situation the defendant's subjective intent is irrelevant serious physical injury means impairment of a person's physical condition that creates a substantial risk of death of which causes death or serious and contracted disfigurement or protracted impairment of health or protracted loss of impairment of the function of any bodily organ okay i don't think herpes do any of that but anyway then there's a note at the bottom that says as a result the defendant's assertion that faith did not contract genital herpes from the defendant is irrelevant yeah, I mean, she could have contracted it from somebody else. I'm just saying. A reasonable jury could easily conclude from the trial evidence that the government met these elements. Testimony from Dr. Chris McGrath conclusively established that the defendant had been diagnosed with genital herpes and informed of that, that diagnosis years before having sexual intercourse with Faith. Dr. McGrath also made clear that he had specifically advised Kelly to advise his partners to wear a con and to wear a condom. A reasonable jury could also conclude from the trial evidence that Kelly was aware of the substantial risk that he could infect Faith with genital herpes, given, among other things, one the testimony from Kate that she had contracted genital herpes from the defendant in the early 2000s told kelly so and pursued legal action against him on the basis in 2004 and to the testimony from azrael that she contracted genital herpes from kelly and told kelly of her diagnosis in august 2015 and i don't even think azrael as has herpes to be honest with y'all 
He nonetheless consciously chose to engage in unprotected sexual intercourse with Faith without first informing her he had contracted herpes. A jury could reasonably find that this conduct in this regard created a substantial risk of protracted impairment of health. As Dr. Afef Hoskins' expert testimony established, herpes is a venereal sexually transmitted disease. Once you have it, you have it for the rest of your life. There is no cure, and it is a very contagious transmissible virus that lives in the human body in various tissues in the human body. Genital herpes enters the body from direct contact with the infected person's genital contact, including through sexual intercourse. Once the herpes virus enters the body, it first stays in the local area where it entered and creates a response from the body in that general area and then ultimately over a window of time goes to its preferred location, which is the central nervous system. The central nervous system is the combination of the brain and then the whole rest of the nerves, which is the spinal cord and the rest of the nerves for the entire body. And then they had a government exist, um, exhibit, I think that was showing like a chart of the human body and how it flows through. The initial response known as primary outbreak for genital herpes manifests itself through the appearance of blisters, ulcers, pulses, Puzzles, vessels. Um, there are technical terms, but they basically mean raised areas filled with fluid. If the blister breaks open, then it's red appearing because it's a denoted or raw area within that blister. Wherever the blister appears, it has a lining. Oh Lord! So they're just going on telling y'all about what herpes is, what they look like. Uh, once the herpes virus goes to the central nervous system, it stays there in a specific unique portion of the central nervous system. Once there, it's always there, so it can reactivate and many parts of the body can be affected. When there's reactivation, there can be resurgence of a pattern that is similar to the initial attack or outbreak. Such reactivations are known as secondary outbreaks and can result in similar findings such as the blisters, the vessels, the puzzles, the broken areas, the scabs, the denuded areas. In addition, whether primary or secondary, such outbreaks result in symptoms such as burning, tingling, pain, a sensation of numbness sometimes. Severe pain is at the top of the list. With respect to genital herpes, that severe pain manifests itself as follows. <sighs> Once the vessels, puzzles, blisters appear, there is pain in that general area. It could be before the actual blister has been seen, but the pain is there. It can be during the time when the blister is present, when the blister breaks open and the fluid um, weeps out, and then subsequent to that when it's crusting over. If it's a primary outbreak, the pain is very, very intense because you recall that herpes is preferentially wanted to be with the nerves. So the nerves get over activated, overstimulated. So the intensity of the response, oh God, they go on and on and on. Okay, um, so there may be a stinging, burning sensation actually during the act of, you know, urinating. Therefore, the individual, the body tends to like avoid trying to do that. So because of the pain, because of the burning, um, there can be secondary situations such as the person won't move, the person may not urinate, the person may then retain. Child, what kind of herpes is they talking about? Oh, so that's what I'm trying to describe as the secondary and it's all because it's very severe, high level or intense pain and burning that occurs with the primary outcome. Child, if it was that serious, um, I don't think there would be as many people with it. I mean, it's like over 50% of the population has genital herpes or some form of herpes, I think I've read. So anyway, child goes on, says secondary outbreaks can be either unpredictable or triggered by known factors with respect to the unknown and unpredictable, it could be everything was going along fine in the individual's life and suddenly there was an outbreak. The other end of the spectrum consists of known triggers that occur commonly and regularly when a person is just living their lives, such as monthly menstruation, a common cold, cough, 
or other infection attacking the individual's immunity, exposure to sunlight, as well as other illness such as asthma, cancer, hypertension, diabetes, anything which is already giving a burden to a person's immune system can also be a trigger for the herpes to get reactivated. Put simply, very common everyday things, the types of things that cannot realistically be avoided trigger secondary outbreaks. Okay, so they are basically going over this lady's entire testimony because for some reason they just want to put so much emphasis on this herpes diagnosis so i'm about to skip over a whole bunch of this where they're talking about herpes can also complicate a woman's pregnancy child the girl was not um, pregnant i guess they're trying to reinforce their case that it is a serious injury Okay, then it says, um, put simply, herpes is chronic. It remains. There's a possibility of shedding even in the absence of any, they say shedding. I think they mean spreading. But anyway, nor does prof prophylactic use of antiviral medications like Valtrex completely negate the risk of transmission. And then they read about, uh, because there's a subset and it varies in the range of 10 to 20%, usually there's a subset of situations and people where there will still be the possibility of you transmitting it or shedding it because the Valtrex usefulness is not anywhere close to 100%. Then they go on talking about Valtrex. I have no idea why we are going through five pages of testimony from the doctor then they talk about the New York Public Health Law um, section <clears throat> that was referenced. I'm not reading this. I have read it a hundred times in other videos. And then they talk about he argues about the New York um, Health Law is void of vagueness as it fails to put the public on notice of what conduct what conduct constitutes criminal behavior and authorizes arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement as the court previously recognized the due process clause of the 14th amendment requires that every criminal statute one given gives the person of ordinary intelligence a reasonable opportunity to know what is prohibited to provide explicit standards for those who apply the statute um, a plaintiff making an as-applied challenge must show that the statute in question provided insufficient notice that his or her behavior at issue was prohibited. The standard, however, is an objective one. Whether the law presents an ordinary person with sufficient notice of or the opportunity to understand what conduct is prohibited or prescribed, not whether a particular plaintiff actually received a warning that alerted him or her to the danger of being held to account for the behavior in question. So they are basically saying that you have an obligation to find out if there's a law <laughs> in your state, I guess, against transmitting herpes. And the reason that most states do not have laws like this. Most cities don't have laws like this is because it's stupid and because so many people have herpes that it would be almost impossible, it's virtually impossible to determine who transmitted it to whom. Oh God, they are still talking about herpes. I am just scrolling down through all this stuff. Even if a person or ordinary of ordinary intelligence has notice of what a statute prohibits the statute nonetheless may be unconstitutionally vague if it authorizes or even encourages arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement nevertheless a law need not achieve meticulous specificity which would come at the cost of flexibility and reasonable breadth Moreover, a statute that provides what may be unconstitutionally broad discretion if subjected to a facial challenge may still be upheld as constitutional on an as-applied challenge if the particular enforcement at issue is consistent with the core concerns underlying the statute. Oh, God. Did not represent an abuse of the discretion afforded under the statute. 
And of course, citation alterations and internal quotation marks omitted. Um, Section 2307 of New York Public Health Law provides that any person who knowingly himself or herself to be infected with an infectious venereal disease has sexual intercourse with another shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. A person of ordinary intelligence would understand that he could be charged under Section 2307 for engaging in sexual intercourse knowing himself to be infected with herpes. Okay, who checks... um, sexual health penal codes every time they go to a city or state please um let me know in the comments if you do this okay may i'm almost done y'all <laughs> that's where i am may 22nd 2020 order at 15-17 kelly previously argued that section 2307 was vague because it does not define sexual intercourse or what constitutes an std arguments the court highly rejected he now argues that the law is vague because it does not define infected his argument similarly fails. First, the term infected is unambiguous and has a plain and ordinary meaning. And second, it use here does not stand alone. The statute makes clear that it applies to a person who knows himself or herself to be infected with an infectious venereal disease. As a result, Kelly's apparent claim that the statute applies simply to having a virus rather than having the ability to transmit it is belied by the language of the statute itself when considered in its totality. And then there is a note um, about a case, um, Nwuzuzu versus Holder, Second Circuit 2013. When interpreting a statutory promise, we begin with the language of the statute. If the statutory terms are unambiguous, we construe the statute according to the plain meaning of its words. Then they pick back up, the statute requires not only that a person be infected with the disease, but that the disease be an infectious venereal disease, i.e. a disease that the person has the ability to transmit sexually. As the trial evidence described above showed, herpes is one of such venereal diseases. Then they go on to the California Health and Safety Code. Kelly also argues that the government did not prove that he committed a violation of California Health and Safety Code Section 120290, because the government charged defendant with a repealed version of the statute no longer in effect, a version that reduced the government's burden of proof. Racketeering Act 8 makes clear that the illegal sexual activity at issue in the Man Act predicates was the version of 12920 that became effective in 1998 and remained effective through the time of the charge conduct in April and May 2015 that the California statute was overhauled in 2018. Three years after the defendant's charge conduct does not render the government's charge or the court's instructions improper. In the racketeering context, the relevant consideration is whether the predicate racketeering act was a violation of the relevant state or federal law at the time that the underlying conduct was committed. United States at Davis versus David, 3rd District, 1978. The words changeable under state law, United States Code 18, 1961-1A, mean chargeable under state law at the okay hold on guys i lost my place again charge conduct federal law at the time okay the words chargeable under state law mean chargeable under state law at the time the offense was committed united states versus banano Organized Crime Family of La Casa Nostra, Eastern District of New York, 1988. RICO predicate alleging acts indictable under United States Code 181512 dismissed because the defendant's alleged conduct occurred before enactment of 1512. The charged conduct was indictable under the Mann Act at the time it occurred and the court properly instructed the jury as to the elements of underlying state law in effect at the time. 
in 2015 the operative version of section 12290 titled willful exposure of a communicable disease provided in its entirety as follows except as provided in section 12291 or in the case of the removal of in of an affected <clears throat> I'm sorry removal of an afflicted person in a manner hold on guys Okay, let's try this again. Except as provided in section 12290, or in the case of the removal of an afflicted person in a manner the least dangerous to the public health, any person afflicted with any contagious, infectious, or communicable disease who willfully exposes himself or herself to another person and any person who willfully exposes another person afflicted with the disease to someone else is guilty of a misdemeanor. California Health and Safety Code 12290, effective 1998. As a result, the court's jury charge regarding section 12290 properly quotes the relevant portion of section 12290 that was in effect at the time of the charge conduct and properly sets forth the elements of the charge conduct. Nor did the evidence adduced at trial fail to show that Kelly acted willfully as that term is defined with the respect to section 12290 at the time of the charge conduct and now California law provided that the word willfully when applied to the intent with which an act is done or omitted implies simply a person a purpose or willingness to commit the act or make the omission referred to. It does not require any intent to violate the law or to injure another or to acquire any advantage. California Penal Law 71 effective until 2016. See also People v. Valdez, People v. Atkins, and both of those were cases in 2000. The terms willful or willfully when applied in a penal statute require only that the illegal act or emission occur intentionally without regard to motive or ignorance of the act's prohibited character willfully implies no evil intent. So child, they don't want to get some more um, laws <laughs> to... God. So they found other laws or other cases to support the fact that they used a law that wasn't in effect. If you can't dazzle them with brilliance, razzle them with bullshit. Remember that. So then there is a note as set forth in further detail below the 1998 amendment to the statute added the reference to a new separate provision in California's Health and Safety Code, namely Section 12291, specifically Section 12291 made it a felony and provided harsher penalties, penalties for individuals who expose others to the HIV virus by engaging in unprotected sexual activity without first disclosing their HIV positive statue and acted with specific intent to infect the other person with HIV. This version of section 12291 was in effect at the time of the conduct charged in Racketeering Acts 8A and 8B. But he wasn't charged with giving somebody HIV. Oh my God, okay. Oh Lord, let's see. As a result, the government had to prove only that Kelly purposely or willingly exposed himself to Azrael in the specific circumstances charged in the indictment, that he purposely or willingly engaged in unprotected sexual intercourse with Jane of Azrael without first informing her that he had contracted herpes and obtaining her consent to sexual intercourse. A reasonable jury could certainly reach that conclusion based on the totality of the trial evidence as described herein. Then they have Doe versus Roe. Oh my God. April, let's see. April 25, 2013, finding plaintiff had alleged sufficient facts showing that defendant violated, violated California Health and Safety Code 
12290 where plaintiff alleged defendant knew he was infected with herpes while in relationship with plaintiff and defendant had unprotected okay we're just gonna keep going on and on as a result it does not matter whether kelly actually transmitted oh okay we're getting good here <laughs> As a result, it does not matter whether Kelly actually transmitted herpes to Azriel through sexual intercourse in April or May 2015 when he was in California and you're using the California law. A reasonable jury could certainly conclude he exposed her to it, particularly where, as here, Azriel was diagnosed with genital herpes with the when she finally went to a doctor on August 14, 2015 after suffering a painful outbreak. And we don't have no exhibit showing that there were any medical records showing that she went to a doctor or was diagnosed. Finally, the defendant's challenge to section 12290 on vagueness grounds also fails as the court previously recognized the standard set forth in the United States versus Solano 1987 effectively eliminates facial challenges outside of the First Amendment context that could not also be brought as an as applied challenge since any law that is unconstitutional in every set of circumstances is also necessarily unconstitutional when applied to any plaintiff may 22nd 2020 order at 11 internal quotation marks omitted accordingly kelly cannot succeed on a facial challenge to section 12290 unless he can establish that there is no set of circumstances on which it would be valid. Kelly cannot do so because the statute is not statute is not unconstitutionally vague as applied here, namely to a person's intentional exposure of a contagious, infectious, or communicable disease through protected sexual intercourse with another person. Y'all, I have not read no more about the damn herpes, okay? Okay. Then they, in a note um, on the previous page, they talk about how Azriel um, described the discomfort in her pelvis and lower abdomen um, during intercourse with the defendant and told the defendant about um, this pain during sex prior to being seen by a physician about the pain when her symptoms did not subside and got to the point where she could not physically walk, Jane Azriel went to see the doctor who diagnosed her with herpes. I mean, like, I have never read any stories <laughs> like the ones that she is giving about the painful sex and all that. Girl, sound like you had something else. I'm not reading all these, all this other stuff. I'm skipping over. All this other stuff that has nothing to do with this case. Um, with respect to the fair notice prong. Okay, child. Section 12090 is not vague as applied to Kelly. Significantly, the very first sentence specifically references section 12291 of the California Health Code. They keep talking about this section that has to do with HIV. I don't know why, because he didn't give anybody HIV. At this point, they're just rambling. They are just rambling at this point. And so I'm skipping over this. Oh, like herpes or HIV, for that matter, by engaging in unprotected sexual activity, including sexual intercourse. Anyway, child. Okay, then we go down to man act violation, sexually activity. Um, Kelly challenges the sufficiency of the evidence proving the violations of the man act based on sexual activity with minors. Specifically, Kelly challenges Racketeering Act 5 um, involving Geronda and 9 in sub-predicated Racketeering Acts violations involving Azriel. And then they still have a bunch of notes where they're talking about where the case reference HIV. Um, does Azriel have HIV? Is that what they're trying to tell us why they are referencing this so much? Okay, one, Racketeering Act 5, to convict a defendant of a violation of 18 United States Code, Section 2422B, the government must prove four elements. One, the defendant used a facility of interstate commerce. The defendant knowingly persuaded or induced or enticed or coerced an individual to engage in sex. 
The sexual activity would violate Illinois law and for the individual was less than 18 years old at the time of the acts. And then they cite some cases out of the Second Circuit, um, U.S. versus Brand and U.S. versus Cabrera. With respect to Racketeering Act 5, Kelly first argues that the government did not prove that Kelly used a facility of interstate commerce. His argument likes merit as the government proved that Kelly regularly communicated with Geronda by, cell, by cellular telephone and cellular telephones. Even intrastate constitutes a facility of interstate commerce. I guess if the phone was bought outside of Illinois. Um, see United States versus Giordano. Second Circuit, 2006, um, Section 2425, prohib Prohibition on the Transmission of the Name of a Minor Using Any Facility of Means of Interstate Commerce for the Specialized Purpose Includes the Interstate Use of Such a Facility or Means. United States versus Perez, um, the National Telephone Network is a Facility of Interstate Commerce. And then they have a note where they just got a whole bunch of cases. I'm not reading this. Um, by citing the Supreme Court's decision, United States versus Lopez, Gonzalez versus Roch. The defendant suggests that does not expressly argue that use of the interstate facility based on the interstate call exceeds Congress's authority under the Commerce Clause. First, the. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Ooh, hold on. First, the government respectfully submits that the defendant has not sufficiently raised such a challenge to preserve it. Um, issues averted to in a perfunctory manner, unaccompanied by some effort at developed argumentation, are deemed waived. Internal quotation marks omitted, but even if made sufficiently, his argument is without merit. And then um, United States versus Hunaday in the 11th Circuit in 2004, um, the Code 18, um, Section 2422B does not exceed Congress's commerce power and noting, and they've already stated that in another part of this, so I'm not going to read it again. Um, for purposes of the federal murder for hire statute, um, United States Code 18, Section 1958B2, United States v. Evans, 11th Circuit, 2007, holding that defendant's use of telephones and cell phones alone, even without evidence that the calls were routed through the interstate system, was sufficient to, to satisfy U.S. Code 182422's jurisdictional element. Okay. Next, Kelly argues that the government did not prove that Kelly used a facility of interstate commerce to knowingly... <clears throat> I'm almost finished, y'all. <laughs> I promise. And I promise my voice that I'm almost finished. Um, induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Geronda, who was then 16 years old, to meet Kelly, who was then 42 years old, at his residence on Libya Fields for the purpose of illegal activity. Geronda, like other of Kelly's alleged victims, including Azriel, testified that she had contact with Kelly on every occasion that she saw him at his residence. Um, during, during that six month period that you, Geronda, spent with the defendant, how often did the defendant have contact with you? At every time I was there, according to her, then she was asked how often. <clears throat> oh. How often would you, Azriel, have um, contact with the defendant during the summer of 2015? And then she said, we had sex almost every day. In these circumstances, and given Geronda's age 16, the age difference between Geronda and Kelly more than 25 years, and the frequency with which they had contact, the jury was free to draw the inference as it did that Kelly used the telephone for the purpose of inducing Geronda to engage in an illegal activity, United States versus Vickers, Second Circuit 2017, holding there was sufficient evidence for the jury 
to infer that the dominant purpose for the defendant's transportation of young of a young boy was the purpose of abuse, where defendant um, took boy to multiple trips and abused the boy on each of those trips. Blumfield, United States, Eighth Circuit, 1960. There was substantial evidence, uncontradicted, in fact, from which the jury reasonably and legitimately Lee could infer that Tolson's May 1956 trip was induced by Blumenfield and for the purpose prohibited by the statute. See also Sabani, um, court must view the evidence in the light most favorable to the government, drawing all references to the government's favor and deferring to the jury's assessments assessments of the witnesses credibility and once again we have no government exhibit proving that the conversations actually took place because unless Geronda was recording the phone conversations we don't know what was taking place on those phone conversations and outside of those pictures that Geronda took in that mirror room do we have any proof that Geronda actually was invited <clears throat> was actually invited into the home, spent time in the home. Like the only other proof that we have was the testimony from the Anthony Navarro guy talking about the day that Geronda and Dominique climbed the fence and got onto the property illegally. So finally, Kelly argues that there was insufficient evidence that Kelly did not subjectively believe that Geronda was 17 years old when they engaged in activity and that this belief was reasonable, Kelly's argument fails. Geronda testified that she told Kelly that on the first occasion where she had contact with Kelly, she told him her true age. No proof, notwithstanding Kelly's conclusory assertion to the contrary, the jury was thus free to credit Geronda's testimony as it did that she told Kelly her true age and therefore that Kelly could not have reasonably believed Geronda was under the age of 16. Oh, it was older than 16. So they're basically agreeing that she could have been lying, but because he didn't present a defense, then they had no choice but to believe she was telling the truth. Two, Riketeering Act 9. Next, Kelly argues that there was insufficient evidence that Kelly did not subjectively believe that Azrael was 18 when she had sexual contact with him in California. Again, the jury was free to credit Azrael's testimony that she told Kelly her true age of 17 years old when the summer of 2015 ended and she needed to return to Florida for her senior year of school and that this occurred before she returned home to Florida and before she returned to Chicago and then New York and California. While um, Azrael's testimony on that matter is alone sufficient to justify the jury's verdict in that regard, there was additional evidence that supported Azrael's testimony. In evidence was a letter dated September 19, 2015 and prepared by Azrael's parents authorizing Juice's mother. <laughs> Why we can't get Juice's real name or what her uh, mother's real name is? Valerie Payton Juice's mother. Somebody let me know that um, Juice's mother to be Azrael's guardian until she turned 18 years old. Um, Government Exhibit 475 and 476. Suzette Mayweather testified that she met Azrael. And then also I want to point out here that we kept getting this handwritten note that was still in the tablet that the Clarys were producing as proof of this person, this Valerie Payton person, um, that they had signed guardianship over. However, when the trial comes about, then surprisingly and amazingly, there is a notary, there's a certified letter that was notarized, but the notary didn't testify, didn't come in and testify about this notarized letter. But evidently there was a notarized letter um, in an official capacity that we um, didn't hear from the person who was the notary to come in and give context as to why she notarized this letter, if you guys know what I mean. So I'm, before I continue, I'm going to go back up here and read a note that was at the bottom of the previous page. 
So it says, as Kelly points out, the government introduced evidence recovered from Kelly's storage facility, which included copies of a state ID card with Geronda's photograph and her birth certificate, each of which had been obviously altered to reflect that she was 19 years old. But we know Geronda herself has said that she has provided fake evidence to get into the courthouse to view the trial. And then it says, um, compare government exhibit 70 with government exhibit 414. Kelly argues that the obvious conclusion was that Geronda provided a false ID to Kelly's security team. Not so, given that even Kelly was not in the business of collecting birth certificates, the fact that the state ID was altered in multiple places, even places that would not obviously be needed to alter, Kelly's strong preference for having contact with underage females and Kelly's preference for maintaining collateral, the far more likely conclusion is that Kelly obtained these copies during settlement negotiations and that some juncture, juncture had the copies altered in an attempt to use, so they're guessing and assuming that this is where he got it from, in an attempt to use them in his defense one day. All right. Okay, Geronda testified that in connection with the potential civil lawsuit that Kelly, she gave her civil lawyer copies of her state ID card and her birth certificate. Yet, they did not subpoena the, um, because wouldn't the settlement agreement, like it would be stupid for him to take the evidence that was provided in the settlement agreement and then alter that evidence knowing that they could go back and get the information from the settlement agreement. And then we have Geronda's friend that she made at the court at the hearing in 2008 state that when Geronda first went, like her testimony, not her testimony because she didn't testify, the information that she provided, <clears throat> excuse me, the information that she provided on Dr. Rice when he interviewed her on his um, YouTube channel is very different from what Geronda... <clears throat> oh, Lord, let me get some water. It's very different from what Geronda is saying because according to the friend, they went to this... They were invited to this party by Bubba. And when they got to the party, they asked for identification. Geronda did not have an identification, so she had to leave. But the friend instead went into the party. And then I guess at a later date, there was another party in which Geronda provided the fake ID. But of course, she didn't testify. So she couldn't come in and debunk what Geronda was saying, which I think is just a pity and a shame. But anyway, that's how it played out. So then it goes on. Um, let's see. Let me go back up here for a second. Okay, and then I already read this other part to y'all, and I was going back to read that. And then I was going to pick up. As Suzette Mayweather testified that she met Jane in New York in connection with Kelly's concert at the Barclay Center on September 25th, 2015. And that Kelly then traveled to Washington, D.C. and then returned to New York on September 28, 2015. The following day on September 29, 2015, Kelly, um, Azrael, and members of his inner circle traveled from New York to California. And then they have a government exhibit showing the, the um, travel information. Based on text messages she wrote while she was in California, in early October 2015, Azrael recalled that she had contact, sexual contact with Kelly during that trip, that she believed she was pregnant, and that Kelly urged her to get an abortion because she was only 17. Um, then they have, I think these were text messages. This government exhibit 205A and 205D. Um, based on that evidence, the jury was free to conclude, as it did, that Kelly knew, as, and then Azrael was texting her friend. She wasn't texting R. Kelly, okay? But they were able to surmise from that that he knew her true age at the time of October 25th, trip to California, and that he did not reasonably believe she was 18 years of age. And then once again, 
These text messages are something that Azriel is going back and forth with her friend. There are no text messages of him and Azriel actually having a conversation about her being pregnant or about an abortion. And then we later find, find out that the helpful one pregnant to begin with. So like he did as to racketeer, because following that story, then there would have to be medical records of the abortion, right? Although I believe at some point she stated, or maybe it was somebody else stated that the people came to the apartment to perform the abortions. <laughs> Okay, child, is they still you get using hangers to, to, to do abortions? Like, how can somebody come to your apartment and perform an abortion? Like, what what type of machinery, equipment, like, what is used for the abortion? Or do they give a medication to abort the baby? Like, what what is the process and the procedure, y'all? So, like he did as to Riketeering Act 8, Kelly also er, argues that the record is devoid of evidence showing that Kelly induced, persuaded, enticed, or coerced Azrael to travel to California. But as with Riketeering Act 8, the jury was free to infer as it did. So, the jury was just free to believe all this nonsense that y'all was putting up. Okay, um, they're just basically repeating the travel. Um, at a minimum, it amounts to inducement, whether they're, um, so they made a list of the times that they traveled in the different places they traveled from and to, like from Florida to Chicago, um, her riding with his entourage on travel by the Sprinter or bus from Chicago to New York, from New York to DC, blah, blah, blah. So they're saying at a minimum, it amounts to inducement, which simply means to cause which is all that is required of the state. Um, the record said inducement is in it, and then they're repeating that that they have said a hundred times already, explaining why inducement isn't as um, severe as the actual definition of the word. Then it goes, um, to put another way, it was certainly reasonable for the jury to infer, come on, to infer that he caused the woman to respond and that since the appellate knowingly um, induced or persuaded the victim to make the trip, then she knowingly caused the victim to travel by interstate. And they're talking about another case. Put another way, it was certainly reasonable for the jury to infer from those actions that Kelly sought to cause Azrael's travel throughout the country with him, including from New York to Chicago. Finally, it is of no moment, as Kelly suggests, that Azrael consented to traveling with Kelly or to have sexual activity. As the Eighth Circuit once wrote, the, gra the gravamen of the offense prescribed by Title 18 U.S. Code Section 2422 is knowingly persuading, inducing, enticing, or coercing any woman to go from one place to another in interstate commerce for the purpose of illegal sexual activity, whether with or without the consent of the woman. Eighth Circuit, 1960, emphasis added. And when they're talking about that, they're talking about the Man Act. And as I explained to you guys in the video that I did on the Man Act, anybody who has gone on a trip with a man in which the man paid for that trip and sex, they had sex together, can be charged with the man act. And if the woman refuses to participate in a man act prosecution, then she too can be charged with her own sexualization. She too can be charged with the man act. So be careful when you're accepting dates um, from men you know, to go on trips. And it could even be your boyfriend. Like your boyfriend can say, hey baby, let's go to Jamaica. Let's go to New York. Let's go wherever. If you guys are not married, you could be charged with the man act. Especially if there was a reasonable belief that you guys were going to have sex after you went to that Broadway play and had dinner. So Kelly contends that any sexual activity between Kelly and Azrael in California was incidental to the purpose of the trip. They didn't already said this. I'm not reading this again. Um, as with Geronda, given Azrael's testimony that she and Kelly regularly had sex, 
that Azrael was just 17 and the age difference of 30 years, the jury was free to conclude as it did that the dominating purpose for Kelly's transportation of Azrael was so that he could have sexual contact with her. This inference is of further, of course, further betrayed buttressed by the testimony of Geronda Faith and others regarding the propensity as to which Kelly sought sexual activity. Finally, Kelly suggests that the government did not prove that Azrael's travel from New York to California in October 2015 involved the facility of interstate commerce and suggests that such a facility includes only a phone or a computer. The facility of interstate commerce was the interstate highways between New York and California including I-80, and then they have a government exhibit. An interstate highway is certainly a facility of interstate commerce. So guys, whether you fly, take a train or drive or walk or ride a bicycle, if you cross state lines, you could be guilty of the Mad Act. E, forced labor. Kelly um, challenges the sufficiency of the evidence proving the predicate acts alleging forced labor in violation of United States Code 18, Section 1589, specifically Kelly challenges Racketeering Act 6 involving Geronda, 11 involving Azrael, and 13 involving Faith, all alleging violations of United States Code 18. At Section 1589, to convict a defendant of a violation of that particular code, the government must prove four elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Page skipped. One, the defendant obtained the labor of services of an individual. Two, the defendant did so through one of the following prohibit prohibited means. A, through threats of serious harm to or physical restraint against said individual or any other person. Or B, through a scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause said individual to believe that non-performance would result in serious harm or physical restraint said individual or any other person and three the defendant acted knowingly one racketeering act six kelly argues that the government did not adduce sufficient evidence to establish the second element a casual link between the oral sex by geronda and other threats of physical violence not true geronda testified that over a six-month period kelly promulgated a number of rules <laughs> Do we have any witnesses to corroborate that Geronda was actually with this man? <laughs> Other than the two times she showed up at his house for parties. Is there any proof that she was there? Did anybody testify that they saw her at that house? Other than the time that Navarro saw her trying to break in, jumping over the fence. Geronda testified that over a six month period, Kelly promulgated a number of rules that she re was required to follow and that he punished her. And where was um, Geronda mama while she was gone for six months at the age of 16? She did not comply with his rules and demands. For example, when Geronda ran through Kelly's gate, Kelly later told her that she would be on punishment. On other occasions, when Geronda broke a rule by not agreeing with Kelly, which Kelly viewed as disrespectful, Kelly slapped her. Once again, no exhibits proving any of this happened. In January 2010, on the final occasion that Geronda saw Kelly at his residence at Olympia Fields, Kelly reacted with anger when John Geronda did not stand up and greet him when he entered the room where she was. Isn't that Faith's testimony that he she had to stand up and greet him, and when she didn't, he left her in the room and went back to the studio? In response, Kelly slapped her, choked her until she passed out and spit on her. And he then instructed her to give him oral an instruction with which she complied in light of the totality of Geronda's testimony with the backup of the prior physical violence by Kelly in the combination with the testimony from any other victim witnesses showing a pattern of Kelly's modus of operandi. The jury was free to conclude, as it did, that she gave him oral sex to avoid further physical violence by Kelly. Choices between, then they say C. Payne, which is another case, choices between competing references lie solely within the province of the jury. Basically, the jury can believe whatever they want. Um, next, Kelly argues that Congress did not intend Section 1589 to apply to the instance of forced labor as alleged by Geronda. 
he is wrong. As described above, the conduct falls within the plain language of the statue after grooming Geronda over a period of approximately six months and punishing Geronda when she violated or any of Kelly's rules, the defendant obtained labor, oral and vaginal sex from Geronda by implicitly threatening additional physical harm if she did not comply. Kelly's citation to United States versus Tav Aviv, a case by which the court is not even bound, which was Sixth Circuit 2014, does not compel a different conclusion. As Kelly notes in Tavev, the Sixth Circuit, Sir, the Sixth Circuit wrote, part of a fair reading of statutory text is recognizing that Congress legislates against the backdrop of certain express presumptions. There, the, Sir, the Sixth Circuit recognized a parent's longstanding right to parent their child without interference from the government and declined to uphold a forced labor conviction of a guardian who obtained labor from children under his care. According to the circuit, in, it interfered with widely, widely accepted parental rights and ran afoul of the Supreme Court's longstanding recognition that the 13th Amendment was not intended to apply to exceptional cases well established in the common law at the time of the 13th Amendment such as the right of parents and guardians to the custody of their minor children or wards, Tavev at um, 65 to 26. Well, I'm sure if we go back and re research all these cases that the government has cited, we'll find out that they didn't apply to this case either. Additionally, unlike the cases cited in Tavaviv, application of the forced labor statute does not require reading of the statute that criminalizes traditionally local criminal conduct. Unlike a forcible rape, a crime which has been long reserved for the states to prosecute, Kelly used a variety of tactics over the course of time designed to cause his victims to serve him. That conduct falls squarely into the conduct prescribed in Section 1589 and does not interfere with the enforcement of criminal activity traditionally reserved for the states. There are also no unexpressed presumptions that caution against application of the forced labor statute here. Indeed, it would be, pres it would be perverse to argue that an adult harbors a right over their intimate partner similar to a parent's right over one's child, even if, as with Geronda, the partner is underage. Two, Racketeering Act 11, Kelly argues that the government also failed to adduce evidence supporting a casual link between the threat of serious harm and Kelly's obtaining labor from Azrael in the form of having contact, sexual contact with other women and men. Kelly's argument is not at all persuasive. At trial, the government introduced ample evidence showing that Kelly used a combination of threats of force, threats of physical restraint, and a scheme, plan, and pattern intended to cause Azriel that if she did not perform such labor, she would suffer physical harm and physical restraint. Um, Fail to see that. At the outset, Kelly established a pattern whereby pun he punished Azriel if she violated any of his rules or otherwise interfered with his desires. She explained that beginning when she was 17, Kelly spanked her if she violated the rule and that these spankings occurred every two to three days. And of course, we have no government exhibits to pr prove that any of that happened. No cooperating witnesses to say that they saw him spanking her or anything of the like. The spankings left her bruised and sometimes with broken skin. She testified, I remember him saying that he has protocols and rules that need to be followed and that a chastising, a spanking was only to help me be better and remember the small things just in case I was not remembering the things to do. And can y'all imagine, um, can y'all even picture R. Kelly saying protocol or chastising, talking to one of these dingbats? Azrael's testimony about chastisements by Kelly was corroborated in large part by letters seized from Kelly's residence and storage facilities after his arrest. Letters that she wrote and that you don't know when she put in that storage because she had access to the storage. Kelly also physically abused Azrael when he perceived that she violated one of his rules or desires. Azrael also saw Kelly physically abuse his other living girlfriends and believed that he could do the same thing to her. On other occasions, Kelly left Azrael in a room or on a bus for days at a time if she violated a rule. 
and then they have um, text message as the government exhibits um, text messages where the employees were actually talking about Azrael not getting off the bus and in reality she couldn't get off the bus because some of the places she wasn't old enough to be in and other times she was doing her school work because remember she was homeschooled and so she would stay on the bus to do her homework. Kelly also had Azrael regularly write a series of letters containing embarrassing falsehoods and on occasion make videos containing embarrassing falsehoods and other humiliating activity. Don't see any exhibit showing that she provided that. Um, the government also introduced evidence showing the labor Kelly obtained as a result of the coercive conduct described above. First, Azrael testified that as a punishment, Kelly directed her to have sexual contact with Alex, which we already talked about, also known as nephew. Azrael explained that she did not want to have sexual contact with Alex and only did so because if she did not, she believed Kelly would have spanked her. Azrael also had sexual contact with other women at Kelly's direction. She further explained she did not want to have sex with any of these women and only completed with Kelly's direction because he forced her to do so, including as a punishment, and that when she did not comply, he usually chastised her. Still, no exhibits proving this, just Azrael claiming that this happened. Based on Azrael's testimony alone, in which she expressly stated that she engaged in contact with another woman, another man, and other woman because she knew that Kelly would spank her if she did not, there was more than sufficient evidence for the jury to find, as it did, that Kelly used threats of force, threats of physical restraint, and other tactics to obtain labor with Azrael, including sexual contact with Alex and other women. While unnecessary to recount the purpose of this motion, Azrael's testimony was further supported by a litany of other evidence, including, among other evidence, Dr. Don Hughes' testimony about a series of coercive tactics used to control victims, Haley's testimony about coercive tactics Kelly used on her, Suzette and Alizette Mayweather's testimony about information they learned from Dominique and Holly. Then there's a note that says another humiliating video was recovered from an iPad found in Kelly's residence on the day of his arrest, um, still image showing one of Kelly's female guests rubbing feces over her naked body. So we can talk about these government exhibits like this, but we haven't mentioned that one government exhibit showing any of the stuff that Geronda or Azriel claimed happened. And then picking up where I left off, um, letters written by Azrael, Dominique, and other women were found in Kelly's residence and or storage facility and the video recordings introduced by the government. Three, Racketeering Act 13. Um, Kelly argues that the government also adduced insufficient evidence to show that Kelly obtained forced labor from Faith. Um, Faith testified that in December 2017, she saw Kelly in Dallas where, one, Kelly told Faith that he needed her to sign certain per papers for his protection. Two, Kelly had Faith send, her, send him a text message falsely claiming to want to be with Kelly and, and the girls. Three, Kelly told Faith that his girlfriends had a set of rules that they were required to follow. And four, Kelly introduced Faith to another of Kelly's girlfriends, Joy, with whom Faith stayed in a locked sprinter van at Kelly's direction for some hours and who told Faith that she needed to get permission to even leave the van to use the restroom. Okay, then that ends. Then it says, when Faith turned to San Ant returned to San Antonio, Kelly monitored her clothing and her whereabouts. And then they have an exhibit of that text message, but not any exhibits from the previous stuff. Faith next saw Kelly in Los Angeles in January 2018, where Diana Copeland had Faith wait for hours in the Sprinter van and then had Faith wait in a room in a studio without food or water. And this is stuff they've already talked about, so I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, where they're talking about the small closet where he allegedly had the gun. They're just repeating what they wrote earlier. Okay, then we're going to go down to three. There was sufficient evidence establishing counts two through nine. 
Kelly also challenges, and guys, this is it. All right, I promise. <laughs> Kelly also challenges the sufficiency of the evidence as to counts two through nine because each of counts two through nine was a predicate racketeering act challenged by Kelly, and there was sufficient evidence establishing each of those predicate racketeering acts. There was also sufficient evidence of counts two through nine. Conclusion. For the foregoing reasons, defendant's motion for judgment of acquittal should be denied. Okay, guys. They took 109 pages to just regurgitate the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over over again. It still doesn't mean that any of this alleged behavior rose to the level of a racketeering or conspiracy or RICO, okay? That this was some organized crime. When you consider this is stuff that was alleged to have happened over 30 years, these are isolated incidents and that none of it leads to a ongoing enterprise. Like none of these people are connected, like really connected. So they got Stephanie, Azrael, Geronda, and Faith claiming that he gave them herpes, but none of them really have proof that he gave them herpes. The only person we have is the girl who sued him for the herpes and got the $200,000. But even she admitted that she still wanted to be in a relationship with him. Like, this is just so crazy. I mean, this to me is just, Women consenting to be in a relationship with a prominent person, a popular person, a celebrity, and them willing to do whatever it was to be in his good graces. All of them had the opportunity to not be in these relationships, excuse me, because they were all allowed to come and go as they please. Nobody was held captive in a house in Atlanta Nobody was chained to any walls. These women came and go and went as they please. We know that Faith flew back and forth. We know that even though Azrael lived with him, that she went home several times and chose to come back. Um, we know that she was 17 when she met him, yet her parents signed over custody I don't even know if them signing over custody was legal to a person that they had never met. And then we have a notary who allegedly notarized the document without having met Valerie Payton or spoken to Valerie Payton. So is that even legal? That's crazy. Anyway, y'all know my feelings on this. Just a bunch of BS. But I am going to go ahead and end this here. Thank God it is over and done with. (laughs) Go ahead, leave your comments below, rate the video, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And until the next time, I shall talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.